Found mostly in marshes and jungles, Acatina limusegnus is a very slow, very non-threatening land mollusk. It might be the simplest creature on the island to hunt, and while it only provides a small amount of meat and chitin, an easy meal is always of value on the island. Unlike nearly every other creature on the island, Acatina does not defecate normally. Instead, it secretes a thick, sticky substance. Acatina leaves trails of this slime, but the trails are so thin that they crumble to dust quickly. Legend has it that Acatina can be tamed with a special cake made from harvested crops and resources. There is a very disgusting but useful fact about Acatina that causes tribes to seek to tame them. Its secretions are chemically similar to the cementing paste and organic polymer used by many tribes for building materials. Tamed Acatina naturally accumulates this slime over time, which can then be collected at the tribe's convenience. Smaller but faster than Tyrannosaurus, larger but slower than Carnotaurus, Allosaurus theratribus is the island's resident pack-hunting theropod. While most aggressive theropods are relatively solitary creatures, Allosaurus lives in groups of three. One Allosaurus is the alpha, while the others are its mates, or a beta male. Like humans find value in forming a tribe, the Allosaurus has evolved to hunt in packs. Its saw-shaped teeth leave its prey bleeding and maimed, making escape difficult. Once an Allosaurus slows a creature with its cutting bite, the rest of its pack quickly closes in for the kill. Not everyone thinks a tamed Allosaurus is ideal. Those who appreciate speed generally tame Carnotaurus, while those who value raw stopping power tame Tyrannosaurus. However, Riders of Allosaurus tend to respect the utility of its alpha pack status, which along with its bleed-inducing attacks and relative mobility, can effectively turn the tide of a combined arms battle. Of all the creatures in the sauropod family, Amargosaurus titanicus is likely the most unique in appearance. It sports two parallel rows of dorsal spines down the length of its neck, back, and tail, though the neck spines are significantly longer than the back or tail spines. These spines are a remarkable adaptation, giving Amargosaurus unmatched control of its body temperature. Made even more marvelous by their time on this arc, their spines store both extreme heat and extreme cold, effectively allowing Amargosaurus to live comfortably in any environment. Its sails also make it an abnormally capable swimmer for a sauropod. Unlike most sauropods, Amargosaurus is very prone to violent aggression, attacking most predators and humans on sight. I suspect this behavior developed alongside the dangerous spines it uses as weapons. Once finely tamed, it's no surprise that Amargosaurus's regenerating spines can be put to potent use. If removed early, their thermal storage becomes erratic, which is perfect for catalyzing sap extraction in large trees. Some tribes, inevitably, have adapted this thermal quirk for combat. By coaxing the Amargosaurus to eject a spine before it sheds naturally, the disruptive thermal waves which emanate from the spike can wreak havoc on nearby armor materials. Interestingly, simple armor is barely affected, while armors constructed of more complex attributes are rendered largely useless. Such a strange reaction. But then... Little about this particular art seems sensible to me. Usually found in the deepest parts of the water around the island, Ammonitina multiamicus has a strange relationship with the other creatures of the deep. It must do something beneficial for them, since every nearby sea creature defends Ammonitina when it is attacked. What this distinct symbiosis is based on, alas, I have not yet discovered. Ammonitina has also made its way into the deeper parts of many underwater caves, even within these caves, the creature will draw attention if assaulted, making harvesting its resource-rich shell a tricky proposition, depending on what other dangers may be lurking nearby. Like many of the untamable ocean dwellers, Ammonitina still has enough utility to be a valuable hunting target. If a tribe is willing to risk the wrath of nearby would-be protectors, Ammonitina bile can be harvested from the innards of its corpse. This bile can then be worked over with other chemicals to produce powerful concoctions, the most notable being a mixture that causes creatures to become enraged and attack the source of the scent. Andrew Sarkis is a beast that's full of surprises. 
These ungainly creatures might seem sluggish while foraging for a meal, but they can move unexpectedly fast when provoked. Like certain other whippomorphs, Androsarchus will aggressively defend its territory against interlopers. With some distance between you, it may be possible to dodge a charging Androsarchus. They don't exactly turn on a dime. Just don't expect a river or lake to protect you from one. As long as its feet can reach the bottom, Andrew Sarkis will plough its way right through deep water. These scavengers will tear into just about anything if hungry, but they've got a bit of a sweet tooth. I've seen many an agitated Andrew Sarkis pacified by some honey. Once tamed, Andrew Sarkis is a reliably fast beast of burden, as long as you don't need it to take any corners at full speed. Its density in water also makes Androsarchus ideal for searching ocean floors for pearls, since it sinks so readily to the bottom. The preferred saddle design includes a mounted minigun to target foes, while the driver stays safe inside their airtight armoured enclosure. Though a fully armoured Androsarchus can't absorb as much damage as some of the Ark's larger creatures, it still excels at harassing them. Whether its size is caused by adaptation to the island's other inhabitants or by crossbreeding with another larger species, Melanocetus anglopescum is the largest form of anglerfish I've ever heard of. Typically found among the deepest, darkest expanses of the ocean, this creature preys on smaller fish while being an excellent source of food for larger predators. Melanocetus has an array of bioluminescent light pods at the end of stalks on its head. Like typical anglerfish, it primarily uses these to attract smaller creatures and trick them into coming close enough for Melanocetus to consume the prey. This often makes wild Melanocetus itself relatively easy to spot among the briny depths. Exploring the depths of the ocean can be difficult. The cold, the lack of air, and the shocking absence of light combined to make travel very dangerous. A tamed anglerfish can use the natural light at the end of its stalks to illuminate the depths, making exploration not only safer, but more lucrative. As I've heard, some survivors use this creature to harvest the silica pearls found throughout the ocean's depths. Unlike many of the herd animals on the island, Ankylosaurus crassicutus tends to live in small family units. I believe they can afford to stick with smaller groups because of their incredibly thick skin, for which they're named. Despite not being among the largest of the island's herbivores, Ankylosaurus is one of the more difficult creatures to take down. Its thick, armoured skin seems to make it more than a match for several of the mid-sized predators that would otherwise hunt it. Reckless carnivores are just as likely to hurt themselves on Ankylosaurus spikes as they are to get hit by its tail. Without a doubt, the best trait of a trained Ankylosaurus is its enormously dense tail. This tail is powerful enough to quickly shatter the resource-laden rocks of the island. One of the wealthier human tribes on the island utilises a squad of ankylosaurs in its mines and quarries. The creature's affinity for metal enables it to carry raw ore at an effectively reduced weight. I don't know where to start with the Raniomorphus amalgotantibus. It has so many of the nightmare-inducing traits of spiders from among many family and genus. It fires webbing like a bowler spider. It spits venom like a lynx spider. It has a poisonous bite like a myriad of spiders and can see in the dark by sensing vibrations. And to top it off, Araniomorphus is larger than an adult human. If that wasn't enough, I'm convinced that some of the caves on the island have actually been dug by Araniomorphus. But this worries me. Either Araniomorphus is a colony spider like ants, or there is a much larger Araniomorphus somewhere on the island. As long as it is kept far from arachnophobics, domesticated Araniomorphus makes an excellent guardian creature for anyone wanting to avoid killing. Their strange web spraying behaviour is also quite helpful while hunting fast, fleeing prey. They are too small to be used as mounts, however. Approximately one metre long, the Archaeopteryx magnamilvum is a primarily tree-dwelling protobird. It avoids the ground as much as possible, preferring to stay in the safety of the tree line, where few predators can reach it. I've not seen an Archaeopteryx outright fly yet, so it's possible that they cannot generate enough lift to do more than glide along distances between perches.
I'm not sure how a creature so fearful of the ground can be such a picky eater, but Archaeopteryx only seems to consume certain rare insect matter. The most likely explanation is that it tends to nest in infested trees, stripping them bare of such food sources. While not large enough to bear the full weight of an adult human, Archaeopteryx still has great utility. Despite the creature's inability to fly, its wings have sufficient strength to dramatically slow the rate of a person's descent if that person holds onto Archaeopteryx while airborne. Taming Archaeopteryx can be somewhat troublesome, though, as it refuses to eat most common food sources and glides to prospective safety at the first sign of any interloper. Lording over the skies across the island, Argentavis artricolum has few aerial rivals. It is a small consolation for the island's other avian creatures, then, that Argentavis seems to have little interest in anything alive. Argentavis is actually slower than the island's far more common pteranodon, but it possesses significantly more stamina and can sustain flight for approximately three times as long. Its weighty stature, in comparison to the pteranodon, allows it to utilise its talons to support the weight of an additional passenger. Considering its saddle doubles as a mobile crafting station, it makes Argentavis an excellent creature for travelling and hauling cargo over long distances. Quite apart from what I would have guessed, Argentavis does not have the stooped neck typical of modern buzzards and vultures. I don't know if it adapted this stronger neck to deal with the predators on the island, or if its lineage derives from before the stooped neck became common in carrion-eating birds. Whichever it meant to be, it has enabled Argentavis to carry smaller creatures with its beak. The fact that this creature exists is enough to give me nightmares. Like the island's other arthropods, Arthropleura felsanguis has become much larger than I might have believed possible. It's a very aggressive hunter, but prefers to eat meat after it has rotted for some time and will voraciously seek out such delicacies. Arthropleura's blood has a very low pH, to the point that it can dissolve many materials. This acidic blood splashes back on anything that directly attacks it, weakening the durability of weapons and hurting attackers. Many creatures thusly refuse to prey on Arthropleura, fearing this unique defence. If that wasn't enough, Arthropleura also keeps a small reservoir of blood ready to spit at its prey. Like most of the arthropods on the island, Arthropleura is simple-minded and relatively easy to tame. It is an almost entirely military mount, useful mostly for attacking at a distance. Thanks to its unique defences, whether hunting or warring, Arthropleura is generally safe from all but the largest of creatures. Like the Carnotaurus, Baryonyx aquafulguar is a large carnivore, but not large enough to rival the island's apex predators. While not as powerful as some deep-sea predators or Spinosaurus, Barry Onyx is an extremely fast swimmer who is still sufficiently nimble enough to threaten most creatures on the island. And yet, despite being a fast, dangerous dinosaur, Barry Onyx almost exclusively consumes fish and other water dwellers. The highly specific metabolism of Barry Onyx seems to allow it to heal wounds almost preternaturally fast after feeding on nutritious fish meat. Perhaps this is why Barry Onyx rarely attacks land animals. Baryonyx's natural affinity for aquatic predation means that once tamed, it learns to kill ocean dwellers even more efficiently. Between its speed and its power, Baryonyx makes an ideal choice for anyone interested in frequently moving between water and land travel, and who values speed and agility over raw strength. More than twice the size of wild Titanoboa exornanter, Serpens Regulus is the largest and most lethal snake I've encountered. With a skull that's more draconic than serpentine, it possesses a powerful bite, made even deadlier by the potent venom dripping from its fangs. The unique shape of its skull allows serpents to hunt in a way that other snakes cannot, by burrowing. Once underground, it simply waits for its victims to approach. Fortunately, its forked tail is usually still visible, poking just above ground. Miraculously, survivors have not only managed to tame Serpent's Regulus, but ride it. Some can even stay seated while it lies in wait below ground, though I doubt it's a pleasant experience. 
While a wild serpent can only be forced out of hiding by fire or explosives, once domesticated, it is easily trained to burrow or surface on command. One of the stranger creatures in the waters surrounding the island is Basilosaurus salacium facit. It's a powerful swimmer, which is adapted to the shallows so remarkably well that it rapidly recovers from injuries when near the water's surface. Conversely, it's vulnerable to deep water pressure, which slowly causes it harm. Basilosaurus is usually closely followed by other predatory creatures, as its eating habits leave plenty of scraps for scavengers to consume. It is a gentle creature towards humans and happily laps up food directly from them. However, the creatures that trail the Bazzi tend to become dangerously enraged whenever this occurs, as it leaves no leftovers for them. Despite the hassle of engaging with its ornery followers, many tribes still attempt to tame the Basilosaurus, as its mammalian, warm-blooded circulation provides a rider with perfect comfort from both heat and cold. Being apprehensive in nature, Basilosaurus is equipped with a defence mechanism that prevents it from being stunned or shocked. Alternatively, Basilosaurus is hunted, perhaps too vigorously, for its special blubber, which can be efficiently refined into gasoline. In the wild, Apis lithohermia drones never stray far from their nests, which they build high in the island's redwood trees or on rocky cliffsides. Apis drones can be seen swarming around the nest in groups, but to get a look at the queen apis, one would need to crack open the nest itself. Speaking from experience, this is not a pleasant task, as the untamable apis drones are quite territorial. I probably should have seen that one coming in hindsight. Take caution, apis stings will significantly weaken any creature which suffers them, and because its stinger is not barbed, Apis can sting multiple times without its stinger being ripped away. A tamed apis queen will lay new drone eggs and construct a nest that survivors can farm for honey, so long as they remember to wear specialised beekeeping gear. Said honey is not only sweet and delicious, but laced with scents that land mammals find irresistible. Many hunters use it to bait their traps. Apis drones will also follow their queen into battle, so they can be used for self-defence in a pinch. Beelzebufo palucocus is the largest frog I've ever seen. Almost impossibly large, it can actually fit a full-grown human adult on its back, though just barely. This is a dangerous prospect, though, as secretions from Beelzebufo's skin and saliva have a narcotic effect on most creatures. Not surprisingly, Beelzebufo is adept at killing insects. Its lengthy tongue allows it to quickly grab prey from afar, killing most insects near instantly and quickly digesting them. It even combines the narcotic chemicals in its mouth with the insect's chitin to create a specialised sticky substance. Tamed Beelzebufo make for strange mounts. Strange mounts for strange people. Many tribes don't believe there's any reason to ride them but some enjoy the ability to take large vertical hops up huge walls and cliffs. Regardless of how it's ridden, Beelzebufo is almost employed for its ability to quickly cull insects and convert them into always useful cementing paste. Among giant creatures I've seen on the island, Brontosaurus lazarus is larger than any sauropod I've read about. In fact, the dinosaur is so massive that it serenely ignores most other creatures. I've seen a pack of raptors tear apart small dinosaurs while Brontosaurus continues eating, seemingly oblivious to the hunting pack. Because of how docile it is, the Brontosaurus makes for an ideal pack animal. Peaceful tribes use it to carry incredible quantities of resources, while warring tribes use it to mobilise their army. Its size and strength make it one of the unique creatures on the island that can support a platform saddle. Unfortunately, its enormity means that the process of taming a brontosaurus can take a very long time. Some may think this is an apatosaurus, dreadnoughtus, argentinosaurus, or some other sauropod. But this is a strange island, and I'm the one doing the research. I'm convinced that this genus is brontosaurus, and no one can tell me otherwise. My study, my rules. Microluminous globulus is best described as a slobbering, roly-poly ball of affection. 
Just like its kin, it is completely harmless, despite its pronounced fangs. So if a survivor sees one running towards them, they should prepare to be licked, not bitten. Unfortunately, being so ugly that you're cute is not an effective means of self-defense, which lands it near the bottom of the food chain. Its charge light may intimidate some predators, but it attracts just as many. While microluminous globulus has skin reminiscent of lizards or amphibians, its behavior is incredibly similar to a common canine. This has made it a particularly popular choice as a companion and source of charge light. But remember, whatever shoulder you rested on will be covered in drool within minutes. Carbonemis obibimus is one of the least aggressive creatures on the island. Were it not for the plethora of predators on the island, I'm quite certain that it would spend its days basking in the sun, eating or sleeping. Carbonemis leads a simple, solitary life. Nevertheless, it seems to be one of the most peaceful animals I've yet encountered. With its slow walking speed, the only things that keep it safe are its surprisingly fast swim speed and its incredibly thick shell, which can absorb tremendous damage. Carbonemi's swift swim rate, fairly high strength, superior shell defenses, and lack of real threat makes it an ideal armored mount for many survivors who shy away from violence. It can carry its rider to the ocean's resources at fairly high speed, and it's not particularly dangerous to tame. I feel lucky to have crossed paths with Carcharodontosaurus medicupestus and lived to tell the tale. Though I'm not sure if this predator grows bigger than a Giganotosaurus, I hope to never find out. Just one of these bruises held its own against an army of us, and that encounter cost us dearly. Carcharodontosaurus can sweep aside attackers with its tail, but it's the other end you'll really want to avoid. It has teeth like steak knives, set in jaws strong enough to shred most prey. Even a near miss will carve you up, but good. Like its namesake, the great white shark, Carcharodontosaurus gets more dangerous once it tastes blood. Each kill seems to give these monsters a rush and drive it into a berserker frenzy. Anyone that manages to tame a Carcharodontosaurus will gain a new way to rally their tribe for battle. There's something about this monster's roar that drives others to fight. A war cry for Hell's own army. The more tactical tribes will let their Carcharodontosaurus tear through the mid-sized creatures in their enemy's ranks, thereby building up its blood rage to take on the largest threats. Huh. Talk about shock and awe. Carnotaurus pressa is a distinctive creature that falls between a medium and large predator. It lives primarily on flat, clear ground, where it can capitalize on its speed. Additionally, it seems to have no qualms about running away from larger predators instead of fighting. The horns of the Carnotaurus seem to be used more for fighting rivals than actual hunting. This doesn't mean the horns aren't dangerous, though. They can still eviscerate larger prey. Carnotaurus is one of the smaller and more compact of the large predators. If Tyrannosaurus is the lion of the island, Carnotaurus would certainly be the cheetah. The real threat of a Carnotaurus is not being able to escape it once it has spotted you. Carnotaurus fills a very specific role. Larger and almost as fast as a raptor. Smaller, but much faster than a rex. Were it not for the creature's extremely long downtime after sprinting, it might be among the most capably balanced mounts. Castoroides is a large mammalian herbivore that tends to live near water. Unlike other larger beaver species, this one retains the chisel-shaped teeth of modern beavers. As is typical for beavers, they build dams as habitats, but the larger creatures on the island have a tendency to trample them. As a result, finding unsullied dams in the wild is quite rare. Castoroides itself doesn't seem to realize how dangerous the island is. I don't know if it's simply too dumb to notice the dangers, or if it just doesn't care. But Castoroides happily goes about its day, playing in the water and gnawing on wood. The value of a tamed Castoroides is obvious from its physiology. The creature naturally gathers wood extremely efficiently, far more than most species on the island. It's not the strongest creature, so it can only carry limited amounts. But it is a natural lumberjack. Found in smaller numbers within the island's colder regions, 
Chalicotherium obsidiaquis, is normally a peaceful herbivore that prefers to spend its days lazing about or playing with its family. It is very territorial, however, and the entire family, young and old, will turn against an encroaching creature at just the slightest provocation. A memorable scene to stumble upon is a group of Chalicotherium playing. One odd playtime activity for Chalicotherium is hurling large balls of snow or mud rocks at each other. Smaller creatures in the area shy away from Chalicotherium during this exertion for fear of being buried in snow or gravel. While many creatures are useful while attacking a fortress, Chalicotherium can be trained as mobile artillery. Its unique playtime habit becomes a rather devastating long-range assault tactic when it is given boulders to throw, rather than snowballs. Nidaria omnimorph is another example of a creature which should not exist. It has traits that seem derived from many types of jellyfish. It possesses the size and shape of large egg yolk jellies, the powerful sting of certain box jellies, and the bioluminescence of deep sea jellies. This all combines to make a dangerous creature that lights up the deepest reaches of the ocean. Nidaria is not generally aggressive because it lacks normal perceptive senses. It generally just floats along on the current until something gets close enough to sense, at which point it attacks. While its attacks are not directly powerful, its sting injects an incredibly strong and fast-acting sedative. As Nidaria is barely more intelligent than a plant, there's no effective method to tame one. Most tribes kill Nidaria on sight, then collect its reserve of powerful sedative to use in technically advanced, long-distance tranquilizers. Coelacanth nutritia is one of the few creatures on the island with a relative which can be found back home. The coelacanth thrive in the waters around the island, as well as within rivers and lakes. Unlike most coelacanths, coelacanth nutrition meat contains less oil and urea. In fact, it is one of the healthier sources of meat I've yet found. Most coelacanths are opportunistic feeders that eat anything smaller than itself, likely including baby water snakes, insect and plant life, and perhaps each other. While their limited intelligence makes them unsuitable for taming, coelacanths provide a viable source of meat for coastal or water-dwelling tribes. Many a day has been spent fishing by the water's edge, often with surprising results, as coelacanths often have consumed discarded garbage that is sometimes of great value. Due to their small size, though, a larger tribe would require a significant number of coelacanths to feed itself. One of the smallest predators on the island, Comsignathus curiosicaris, can be seen as a pet, a pest, or a threat. While alone, Comsignathus is not dangerous or aggressive. In larger packs, however, it remembers its underlying carnivorous nature. After a group of Comsignathus grows to a certain size, their pack mentality always seems to embolden them to attack. For some reason, Comsignathus is not naturally afraid of humans. Rather, it seems to be quite curious about humans and their instruments of survival. They tend to be drawn towards humans out of this curiosity and then call their pack mates to help explore their discovery. This usually leads to aforementioned pack aggression, with dangerous results. Comsignathus gain increasingly significant attack power and speed when in close proximity to other Comsignathus, as their pack aggression takes over their behaviour. Additionally, their distress call carries quite far, rapidly alerting the tribe and its pets to danger more efficiently, and increasing the likelihood of forming a so-called compi gang. Even at its most deadly, there's nothing as beautiful as nature. Yet by definition, that beauty only exists if nature is left to run its course, free from interference or invasion. Sadly, that's not what happened here. These poor creatures have been infected and twisted by an outside force. I've seen how element can alter the evolutionary trajectory of a species in small, indirect doses but this goes far beyond that. The element that grows within these animals has taken hold of their minds and driven them mad. They move as one, ravaging everything in their path, and often push themselves beyond their physical limits. We found that they have a sixth sense for element, and on occasion have used that to our advantage. 
otherwise, they are an unfeeling, ravenous horde. At my insistence, we've tried on several occasions to remove the corruption from these hapless beasts, but to no avail. Every time we have to fend them off, I feel a pang of guilt in my heart, but putting them down is the kindest thing we can do for them. Deodon comedentis is the largest known species of entelodont, an omnivorous family of ancient mammals that are sometimes referred to as hell pigs. Even though Deodon has as many similarities to modern hippopotamidae as it does to swiner, I found that to be a suitable nickname. Deodon is as mean as it looks, and any survivor who wanders too close will find that out the hard way. As an omnivore with a voracious appetite, Deodon scavenges, forages, and hunts to survive. It has little qualms when it comes to its diet, and that has helped it thrive on the island's harsh tundra. Its temper hasn't hurt either, as many would-be predators would rather seek out less vicious prey. Many tribes have made excellent use of Deodon packs within their war parties, not only because of its fierce nature, but due to its extraordinary ability to rapidly heal itself. I've theorised that this healing factor is why it seems to have such a high metabolism, though what is particularly extraordinary is its capability to share this benefit with nearby creatures. I've even heard some survivors mention that the Deodon also has a unique ability to root out rare mushrooms as well. The Titanic Corcoi Arrakis is commonly called a death worm by the locals, though I'm not certain that it is actually a worm. It shares some similarities to some segmented worms, namely the aquatic Eunus aphroditois, but its biology doesn't seem consistent with other members of the annelid phylum. However, the death part of its name could not be more spot on. Corcoy is without question the apex predator of this desert. It will devour anything that dares to set foot in the endless dunes, regardless of size or ferocity. Corcoy spends most of its time burrowed beneath the desert sands, exploding to the surface only to devour its prey in a single bite. The only chance of surviving a Corcoy attack is if its initial lunge misses, as it's momentarily immobile afterwards. Theoretically, that could provide a brief opportunity to escape its territory. I wouldn't count on such luck, though. Attempting to tame Corcoy will almost certainly result in failure and a very painful death. Any survivors in this desert should avoid Corcoy territory at all costs. By the time you hear the scurrying claws of the Deinonychus, it's often too late. Superior hunters, they leap from a hiding place and pounce on their prey. The Deinonychus is an agile climber as well, jumping from wall ledge to wall ledge as it seeks high vantage points to lie in wait. A hungry Deinonychus tends to be fearless, and will hunt prey much larger than itself, latching onto a dinosaur's back with its sickle-shaped claws, then starting to feed before its victim is even dead. While it likes its meat fresh, a Deinonychus isn't above scavenging a carcass if no other food is available. Raising a Deinonychus in captivity requires an ample food supply, as they have a fast metabolism to match their high activity level. The Deinonychus is also fiercely territorial near nests with eggs, even if the eggs aren't its own. This makes breeding successive generations a hazardous process. Unless raised from eggs, they cannot be tamed. The hunter instinct of a wild Deinonychus is so strong that it reflexively pounces on a would-be master. Even with all the other monstrosities around here, this fugitive from a creature double feature deserves top billing. I mean, Dracula's right there in its species name. And Desmodus has a shriek that'll scare just about anything out of its way. It's also shrewd enough to limit itself to victims that it can carry off into the night. Although I'm not superstitious enough to advise stocking up on garlic and steaks before you decide to track down Desmodus for yourself, I'd still advise you to hunt these horrors out in the light and away from their caves. They seem uniquely adept at flying and hiding in those dark, narrow spaces. Taming one of these beasties lets you add its eerie abilities to your arsenal. Use their unsettling scream to scatter your enemies. Command Desmodus to snatch up small prey for you. Let its uncanny power to vanish into darkness become your personal stealth mode. Desmodus has blood thinner in its saliva, 
which drains prey of more blood than this vampire could ever digest. If you can stomach the excess blood and drained meat your vampire pet leaves behind, you might be open-minded enough to appreciate another of its unholy gifts, a sanguine elixir that helps enthrall the most stubborn beasts. Dilophosaurus spudatrix is a strange creature. It stands at just over half the size of known Dilophosaurs and runs from aggressors as often as it fights them. Dilophosaurus spudatrix has a few traits not common in the Dilophosaurus genus. It has a very shrill call and a decorative ridge of skin on its neck. I believe these are used to attract mates, as well intimidate prey and would-be predators. Instead of attacking its prey outright, Dilophosaurus spudatrix spits venom to weaken and paralyze it before moving in for the kill. Because of their shrill cry and their ability to attack intruders from range, Dilophosaurus seem most suited as guard dogs. Due to their small size, they are not suitable as mounts. Dimetrodon calorector is a much calmer predator than most on the island. Because it lives off smaller prey than humans, it generally ignores anything much larger than a coelacanth. Dimetrodon is one of the few carnivores on the island that could be classified as reasonably friendly in the wild. The sail on Dimetrodon's back is an especially fascinating thing. It can be angled to provide shade from the sun and allows Dimetrodon to disperse heat more quickly. The inner workings of the sail can also restrict blood flow in the creature to hold in excessive heat. Together, these two traits allow Dimetrodon to comfortably survive in any climate, though they are most commonly found in the swamplands, which are rich in prey. If Dimetrodon was a bit larger or didn't have that massive sail, it would make a decent mount. However, its main use to survivors is to utilize the sail's insulating capabilities. Just being near Dimetrodon gives excellent protection from both heat and cold, which has saved my life through more than one ice blizzard in the frozen Northlands. Dimorphodon equiseca is another of the island's Jekyll and Hyde creatures. It is normally passive, sometimes even friendly. When provoked, it becomes very aggressive. Even against larger creatures, it has no business fighting, often to its own fatal end. Dimorphodon can make short work of smaller opponents, however due to its large, but lightweight, skull and teeth. Barely over a metre tall, Dimorphodon should be low on the food chain, but its incredible speed and surprisingly strong bite make it fairly dangerous, especially en masse, as they tend to attack in groups. A flock of angry or hungry Dimorphodon can take down prey several times their size, so survivors should take care not to hunt near where a flock is gathered. Dimorphodon is one of the creatures on the island that is easily domesticated for companionship, but its use in combat is also quite clear. It will hunt in large groups to seek out enemy dino riders directly, harassing them to no end, regardless of the might of their mount. I believe Dinopithecus has been changed by arc life. This species is definitely larger than any I remember from the fossil record and these oversized baboons show a more pack-oriented behavior than I would have expected in their kind. Whole troops will organize around an alpha and fall apart if that alpha is slain. Though they seem to prefer a diet of fruit, supplemented with the occasional bit of meat, Dinopithecae are opportunistic and will eat just about anything. They're also excellent climbers, I've seen them scramble up sheer cliff faces and leap between trees to scavenge food for their troop. Dinopithecae will bear sharp teeth and toss well-aimed handfuls of their own excrement when provoked. Their feces is what really sets this species apart. They've managed to weaponize a parasite in it that disables tech. I feel like that parasite deserves its own dossier. If you can manage to tame enough Dinopithecae, you'll soon find yourself with a small troop at your disposal. Your mini troop will organize around the strongest of your tames, their new alpha, that can then direct them at a target with a shrieked battle cry. No need to saddle your tamed Dinopithecus to ride it. It will make one for you using its own tail. Just hold on tight and it will take you straight up walls and across zip lines. In battle, your Dinopithecus will fling fecal projectiles, grenades, or a combination that I like to call EBM, for Explosive Bowel Movement. Presiding almost solely within the island swamps, 
Diplocolis natatori nutrix is a small amphibian that primarily eats minor fish. It rounds out what I consider to be the middle bottom of the ecosystem, feeding on the tinier non-insect creatures of the island, while itself being a common snack for the larger carnivores. Because so many creatures prey on it, Diplocolis has become very skittish and often flees at the first sign of trouble. It uses its amphibious nature to escape into whichever environment its predator isn't native to. Diplocolis' unique capability to retain vast quantities of oxygen allows it to effectively remain submerged for hours at a time, usually outlasting even other amphibious creatures that might otherwise prey upon it. There are only a few uses for tamed Diplocolis. It is primarily kept for the rather disgusting practice of employing a Diplocolis as an oxygen bag. Diplocolis stores air in the bladders of its head, and divers can suck from these bladders to take deep breaths while submerged, supporting long-term underwater exploration without the use of external gear. Surprisingly, Diplocolis is also extremely efficient when it comes to hunting trilobites. Despite being one of the island's largest creatures, Diplodocus insula princip is among the island's smaller sauropods. Instead of size and intelligence, Diplodocus develop faster maximum speed and greater endurance. When fully matured, it generally only reaches about half the size of the rather enormous Brontosaurus. Diplodocus is another creature whose continued survival on the island confuses me. It's a very thick-headed and trusting animal, often to its fatal detriment. It never flees from predators until after they've attacked it repeatedly, preferring instead to make numerous fruitless attempts at friendship. For some strange reason, Diplodocus trusts humans so much that it doesn't seem to fight back against them. Ever. Due to Diplodocus' smaller frame, it cannot support the type of platform saddle that other large creatures can. To make up for this, many tribes instead use an 11-seater passenger saddle, which enables Diplodocus to safely transport 10 additional riders. These passengers often use ranged weapons to protect the creature, or to attack nearby enemies while on the move. Found primarily among the island's redwood regions, Arctodus dyrus is an imposing creature. Many on the island have started calling it a dire bear, a name which is appropriate both due to its enormity and its territorial nature. The dire bear ignores most non-hostile creatures, while going about its daily routine of scavenging for meat and edible plant life. That is, until intruders enter the territory it considers its own, at which point the creature ferociously attacks. Most often, it is smartest to just run from an angry dire bear. Once tamed, the dire bear is a strong and reliable mount, it can carry vast quantities of goods and can sprint for extremely long, nearly infinite periods. It is not the fastest creature from a hard stop, but after building up momentum, its sustained overland speed builds to among the best of the island. Of course, being able to feed a dire bear both meat and plant life makes keeping one fairly convenient regardless of the environment. Arctodus has a fondness for honey and can harvest it without getting stung or destroying the hive. Perhaps more rewarding while you are riding it, those pesky bees will completely ignore you. The best adjective to describe Canis maxtyrus is scary. This pack animal is a cunning and brutal predator, capable of taking down prey of nearly any size. In addition to being a vicious hunter, it is the size of a small horse, meaning even the largest predators aren't necessarily safe from the packs. Unlike most creatures on the island, Canis is a dedicated pack hunter and rarely hunts alone. When in a pack, Canis are naturally spurred to fight for their lives with increased effectiveness, while the most experienced Canis will be designated Alpha and gain an even stronger enhancement. The species has an incredible affinity for teamwork. Obviously, Canis is a thrilling battle mount. It is fairly fast, very strong, and agile. It can leap almost as well as the island's battle cats. Riding a supercharged Alpha Canis into battle at the head of a bloodthirsty pack is a thrill for which most warriors would gladly proclaim, today is a good day to die. 
If utilised correctly, Canis can be a useful aid in your discovery efforts. It has developed a keen sense of smell that enables it to detect things that most creatures can't. I've even seen them used to find creatures that are hidden beneath the surface. Raphis replicare, more commonly known as the dodo bird, is quite possibly the dumbest creature I've ever seen in my life. It wanders around the beaches of the island, pecking berries off bushes and being eaten by all manner of carnivore. Without the dodo, the whole island's food chain would disintegrate. This subspecies of the dodo has developed an unbelievably clever way to sustain itself. They mate constantly. I'm fairly convinced that they reach full maturity within a week of being born. This is the only trait keeping them populous on the island. While it can be done, there is almost no reason to domesticate a raphus replicare. It cannot carry enough to be a beast of burden, it does not provide much food, and it's too stupid to show companionship. It could work as a last-ditch food source, though, so I suppose keeping some around for lean times has a certain logic. Didocirus custosaxum is one of the island's non-aggressive herbivores, generally found in the mountains and grasslands. Large and well-armoured, it has a supply of fat under its plates to keep it warm and fed in the cold. Didocirus has adapted well to the dangers of the island, perhaps even better than the Ankylosaurus. Didocirus has two very different reactions to predators. Against smaller foes, it generally uses its spiked tail to inflict as much damage as possible. Against larger predators, however, it pulls its tail underneath itself to form a solid armoured ball that is nearly impossible for creatures to pierce, from which it can actually roll away to relative safety. Didocirus is a highly prized work animal on the island, its spiked tail is ideal for quickly shattering the large rocks, so Didocirus is a very efficient quarry worker. In addition, its affinity for rocks has allowed it to carry stone at a reduced weight. In case their quarry gets raided, Didocirus riders have a very difficult to kill mount. What magic created the Scarabidae gigas, I cannot say. What I can say is that this creature is a perfect symbiont for advanced human tribes. Coprophagic. It eats mostly useless waste, feces. It metabolizes this waste into a more refined waste product, along with an oily byproduct. The oily byproduct is chemically the same as the oil found in the oceans around the island. Somehow, Scarabidae converts feces into oil. If that wasn't reason enough to worship the Scarabidae, the refined waste product is almost identical to fertilizer from a compost bin. Scarabidae makes me think humans have been on the island for a long time. Why else would a creature evolve to be such a perfect pet? Most tribes jealously protect their Scarabidae, whom are handily tamed with the skilled use of some well-handled feces. These wondrous little organic biofactories are truly a sustainable, green, eco-friendly source of resources for living off the land. Oil becomes gas, which is generator fuel. Fertilizer means crops, which is human fuel. The Scarabidae can power all aspects of island life. Dunkleosteus loricorrupta is a very strange creature. It is a fairly large fish, covered head to tail in armoured plates, with incredibly powerful jaws. It tends to eat the island's water-dwelling crustaceans trawling the seabed, as it is not fast enough to catch most of the smaller fish. Dunkleosteus is surprisingly combat-oriented for a fish. Its well-armoured body protects it from many creatures, while its bite is strong enough to easily crush through chitinous shells. Dunkleosteus is an incredibly useful fish for coastal communities. Its powerful jaws make short work of the stone and oil formations found throughout the oceanic depths. While harvesting, Dunkleosteus can defend its rider from all but the largest threats in the waters, and once it is past its prime, the Dunkleosteus itself can be harvested for a fair amount of chitin. Occupying a space in the low to middle end of the food chain, Electrophorus bellua domito is a carnivorous swimmer that feeds mostly off of shellfish and small fish. Despite its common name, it is actually a very long knife fish and not an eel. It does not provide much meat, so many predators simply leave it be. 
Unlike most predators, it does not use brute strength to bring down its prey, but instead releases an electrical charge around itself to knock its prey unconscious. Alone, this can take out a small creature. When attacking together, electrophorus can even bring down the larger ocean life forms and then feed as a group. By far the most common use of electrophorus is to subdue large ocean creatures. Knocking out a plesiosaur or other giant deep sea leviathan can be incredibly difficult. Thus, many tribes employ small schools of electrophorus to shock them into submission. Equus magnus appears to be an ancestor of the modern horse. Based on its stripes, it may be the African variant of Equus giganteus, which appeared in North America during the Ice Age, but that is pure conjecture. Its behaviour in the wild is similar to that of other wild members of the Equus genus. It sustains itself by grazing while keeping safe from predators by living in herds and outrunning its attackers via superior speed and stamina. Horse and man have long been partners in survival, and this remains true on the island. In Equus, survivors will find a trusty steed or pack animal that can carry them swiftly across land. Taming an Equus has proven interesting, requiring carefully approaching the creature in the wild, mounting it, and then carefully soothing over time by feeding it vegetables. In fact, Equus reliability has led some survivors to construct special saddles for them. I even encountered a man who added extra saddle pouches that doubled as mobile crafting stations for chemical supplies, foodstuffs, and other items. Although not as robust as what you might find within a village, this utility helped him live a nomadic, solitary lifestyle. Some survivors employ equus to herd and wrangle other creatures with a specialised lasso. This tool is sometimes effective for self-defence as well, as equus is limited in battle on its own, at least compared to aggressive prehistoric carnivores. Found only in the deepest depths of the waters around the island, eurypterids are dangerous and adaptable arthropods. As likely to hunt as they are to scavenge, a eurypterid rarely has difficulty finding food to keep itself nourished even at the bottom of the ocean. A eurypterid's threat comes not directly from its raw strength. Instead, it combines a hard defensive exoskeleton with debilitating poison to powerful effect. The sting of a eurypterid increases torpor while reducing stamina, quickly rendering its opponent unable to defend itself. While eurypterids are not intelligent enough to be tamed, this doesn't mean they are without utility to tribes. They are a wonderful source of chitin, and their digestive tract often contains silica pearls. They sometimes even have ingested incredibly rare black pearls, used by survivors for advanced manufacturing, making them among the most valuable creatures on the island. A floating beacon of light often found in the deepest pits of these caverns, microluminous Electrion's appearance can seem almost heavenly. Its colourful plumage doesn't hurt either. Even without the charged light it emits, it would give any modern bird on Earth a run for its money in terms of pure spectacle. Although its feathery eyebrows might give one the impression that it is related to owls, it is not a bird of prey. It is entirely docile and shows no aggression towards survivors or other creatures. Microluminous Electrion's ability to fly and the ease with which it perches upon a survivor's shoulder has made it a favoured pet among many. Some consider it the most refined of its glowing brethren, but I think they just want to look like a pirate. Not that I blame them. Most of the creatures I've encountered here have endured thanks to their great size, strength, or ferocity. But the fjord hawk gets by on its wits and by scavenging. The bird also seems to have an almost preternatural ability to predict and avoid danger. Fjord hawks follow predators and survivors from on high watching for their moment to swoop in and snatch up an easy meal. Tamed fjord hawks are surprisingly playful, and their favourite game is fetch. Indulge your bird with this play and a bit of patience, and you'll reap the rewards. Just point out a target, and your fjord hawk will fly off to retrieve it for you. A well-trained fjord hawk can locate injured prey and communicate its find to you. These clever birds will bond with humans as wholeheartedly as any canine or primate, 
in a way uniquely suited to this time and place. If you should meet with some grave misfortune, your fjord hawk will immediately fly off with as many of your belongings as it can carry. As soon as you're respawned by the Ark, your friend will track you down and return your equipment to you. A gentle giant, Macrodryadus crystallinus, spends its days foraging for food in the dense forests it calls home, though it rarely has to look very far. Thanks to its extraordinary digestive system, not only can Macrodryadus eat just about anything, but it can also turn a diet of scraps into a mountain of precious resources. Instead of producing excrement, Macrodryadus grows glittering crystals upon its back, which fall off when they reach their full size. Shattering these crystals can yield precious resources, as Macrodryadus is somehow able to transmute the materials it eats into something entirely different. One of our pilots likened the process to the gachapon machines from his memories of growing up in Japan, and I guess the name stuck. Though its crystals prevent Macrodryadus from wearing a traditional saddle, if its rider is willing to sit in a basket that hangs from Macrodryadus' neck, then they'll find its long claws are well suited for mining resources. Personally, though, I'd keep one around just for the crystals. The free presents, the way they glow at night. <laughs> totally worth the potential nausea from the basket saddle. When someone asks me what the fastest creatures on the island are, Gallimimus is always a contender. Unlike the island's many armoured animals, Gallimimus eschews strong defences for the ability to outrun pretty much anything. A skittish herbivore, Gallimimus even looks nervous when eating in a peaceful, clear meadow. Having no real way to harm predators, it simply runs away and uses its agility to stay safe. I've even seen wild Gallimimus outrun speed-trained Utah raptors. There are two general camps on the use of tamed Gallimimus. One camp thinks that their inability to effectively harm hostile creatures and their inability to harvest most resources makes them primarily a burden to the tribe. The other camp thinks that their extreme speed and ability to jump long distances is among the best for scouting and exploring. However, both camps agree that its ability to quickly transport multiple tribe members is uniquely beneficial. It was always hypothesized that a member of the Tardigrada phylum would be the last species on Earth in the event of a global apocalypse. So in some ways, the existence of Mopsecanescus fluitobesus is completely expected. Its size and method of travel, however, hmm, less so. Mopsecanescus is slow and ineffective in a fight, so to survive, it tends to choose flight. Literally. First, it inflates itself like a balloon, briefly slowing down and gaining durability. Then it launches itself into the air by expelling gas through a series of sphincters in its underbelly, which it also uses to slow its descent. Yes, it's as unusual as it sounds, but Mopsecaniscus makes the most of its inflatable nature. In addition to jumping, it can use its stored-up gases to push back aggressors or even float on water. While a poor steed in battle, Mopsecaniscus is a fantastic beast of burden. The hairs on its back let a single rider steer it without a saddle, and it carries an incredible amount of cargo for its size. A small caravan of these could see us swimming in resources in no time. Gigantosaurus furiosa is an enormous predator, larger even than the Tyrannosaurus or Spinosaurus. Getting cornered or run down by a Gigantosaurus can mean certain death for nearly any creature. Fighting a Gigantosaurus directly is never a good idea, as its rage rapidly grows with every hit it takes. With this rage, it builds increasing reserves of energy to use, making its iron-jawed bites progressively more deadly and enhancing its stamina. Add to this the fact that its huge body also enables it to take a tremendous amount of punishment, and you have a creature that is generally better avoided or outsmarted than attacked head-on. Taming Gigantosaurus is a dangerous prospect. Its rage reaction, even when tamed, can sometimes cause it to briefly turn on members of its own tribe. Indeed, it may even throw off its rider if it has been sufficiently angered. 
And yet, the sheer size and immense power that the Gigantosaurus possesses means that some factions endeavour to tame it as a fear-inducing capital beast of war, even at great risk. Gigantopithecus fibrorator is a strange creature. It is usually quite passive, but it has a very short temper when it comes to its own personal space. Once another creature gets close, this gentle giant quickly becomes a rampaging beast. Best to give them a wide berth. I have occasionally seen Gigantopithecus jumping to grab vines that it can traverse and swing on, but otherwise, it seems most happy to lay about, picking berries from plants lazily. In addition to being at home picking berries, a tamed Gigantopithecus can be taught to harvest the fibres found on many island plants as well. It appears to be entirely content to pick at plants all day, eat the berries, and carrying fibre resources for its tribe. Playful once tamed, Gigantopithecus seems to enjoy throwing the creatures or riders it's carrying into the air. It probably feels that this activity is a game, but clever brigands can use this game to vault over walls and small cliffs. The lightbug is believed to be a descendant of the Lampyridae insect family. Typically, an insect with its characteristics will flourish in areas with no known natural predators. However, I believe the lightbug population is moderated by the amount of creatures that vie for its charged light source. Despite being the source of a prized resource, many tribes believe the lightbug to be sacred and admire it for its illuminance and elegant patterns. Domesticating a lightbug would be a complete waste of time. It is not known to have any useful utility or function. I imagine you could save on fuel by using them to light a settlement. With a body reminiscent of a gecko, fluttery wings and a natural stockpile of charge light, microluminous psyche has an unearthly, if oddly charming appearance. A curious creature by nature, it always gave me the impression that it was studying me as much as I was studying it. A favourite snack of many predators, this small lizard has no natural poisons or any means of defending itself at all, save for a swift retreat and its charge light. Survivors can approach it without fear. As a pet, microluminous psyche is happy to clamber up a survivor's shoulder and cling to it as though it never wants to leave. Evenly tempered and easy to care for after being tamed, it is a stalwart companion and an excellent source of charge light. Griffin Magnificum is undoubtedly a sight to behold. Many ancient myths tell of various depictions of the griffin over the ages, but what is never disputed is its majestic and mysterious nature. With the front half of an eagle and the back half of a lion, it is as if these two creatures somehow fused together to form a superior land and air predator. While one's first instinct might be to approach the creature and marvel at its beauty, that would be a very poor decision. Its range of attacks makes it one of the most versatile predators I've witnessed. If its presence alone isn't enough to intimidate potential hunters, it has the ability to dive from the sky to the ground with such force that it inflicts damage to anyone unfortunate enough to be below it, or carry its momentum back into a rapid uplift. The idea of pacifying such a beast is nothing to scoff at. Its highly independent nature and disinterest with interacting with humans, combined with its power and strength, make the griffin a challenge to domesticate. However, there have been those who are fearless enough to attempt and succeed at this miraculous feat. Once tamed, riding atop a griffin along with a tribe mate passenger, dashing through the air at high speed is a prize in and of itself. Possessing the appearance of a half-duck, half-dinosaur, Hesperonis is a medium-sized fish-eating bird, common in the rivers and lakes of the island. It would be about two-thirds the height of a human if it stood tall, but it rarely does. Hesperonis spends most of its time gliding along the surface of the water, where it is much more manoeuvrable. Hesperonis is barely a threat to any land-dwelling creature, as its legs are too short for it to move around effectively. But it is surprisingly fast in the water. It can easily hunt down fish and other small water-dwelling creatures. Not particularly useful for hunting and not being affectionate, 
Hesperonis is primarily kept for the eggs it produces after consuming much fish. When rendered correctly, the eggs separate into two useful substances. One is a protein substance that is high in calories, and the other is an oily liquid that is effectively the same as the oil found in the ocean. Among the island's most tenacious pack is Hyenodon dyrus, a carnivore most often found across the mountains and tundras in packs of three to six. Hyenodon is a very intelligent predator. Before engaging, it determines if the payoff for a fight is worth the risk of injury. Hyenodon often prefers not to fight unless there is an already weakened prey or a fresh carcass nearby. This temperament changes quickly, though, near the presence of injured creatures. Hyenodon quickly becomes very aggressive, and the pack attacks with ruthless abandon. With each vicious chomp of scavenged meat, the hyenodon rapidly recovers health and stamina. Despite being too small to ride, hyenodon are still popular pets. Their intelligence means they train well, and their natural pack mentality makes them excellent hunting dogs. Their ability to quickly recover health by consuming raw flesh off the bone ensures that they can take punishment, yet continue to fight, and they can efficiently preserve meat in specially crafted saddlebags. A common and terrifying sight on the tundra is a rider on a canis with a pack of hyena don at its side, howls and jeers echoing through the night. Among the most vocal creatures on the island, Ichthyornis piscoquis actually appears to be a relatively normal seagull. It primarily eats fish, and its distinctive cries can be heard echoing over across the island's many beaches. As you might expect from a seagull, Ichthyornis will flee at the slightest provocation. Ichthyornis is a versatile and opportunistic hunter. Its primary form of attack is to dive into the top layers of water and impale its prey. However, since its food source can be unpredictable, Ichthyornis has developed a keen ability to steal food from unsuspecting travelers. Their affinity for shiny objects leads them to sometimes knock tools and weapons out of the hands of unsuspecting survivors, but Ichthyornis is too small to actually fly off with them. Ichthyornis surprised me by being a very loyal and very social creature once tamed. It likes to ride on its owner's shoulder and bring that person treats, in the form of fish, of course, which its beak grip enhances with extra healing vitamins. The personality of Ichthyornis reminds me of a house cat hauling a trophy prey back home, except it brings extra healthy fish instead. Ichthyosaurus curiosa is a comparatively small carnivore found in the waters around the island. It is slightly larger than a human, but that's still small compared to the leviathans roaming these waters. It seems to be very interested in any creature around its size, often approaching and following humans swimming through its waters. Despite its appearance, the ichthyosaurus is neither a fish nor an ocean mammal. Like many creatures in the waters around the island, it is actually an aquatic reptile. I can't think of a better mount for someone starting to explore the island seas and waterways. Ichthyosaurus is a comparatively fast swimmer, and even in the wild will cozy right up to you and try to figure out what you're doing. Taming these is actually pretty easy, as they seem to love humans and will be fed and tamed without the use of violence. Of the many creatures I've yet encountered on the island, the Iguanodon vicissitudinus has the distinctly versatile capability of switching its primary method of locomotion according to its momentary needs. Primarily a rather lethargic bipedal herbivore native to the island's many grasslands and forests, in situations where increased speed or maneuverability is called for, it will quickly shift its posture into quadrupedal stance and behave like a very different creature. While bipedal, it can employ rapid stabbing attacks with its distinctive thumb spikes. In quadrupedal stance, conversely, it seems to have an endless supply of stamina, even while sprinting. Interestingly, the iguanodon's thumb spikes also provide it with the capability to pick seeds out of fruits, allowing a farmer to easily convert stacks of fruits into stacks of seed for planting. 
Combined with its highly effective fruit harvesting and substantial carry weight, the Iguanodon's excellent mobility in bipedal stance makes it an ideal field hand that can also pull off a quick getaway or an agile defense when needed. Scientifically speaking, Renopila amplexus is an adorable little fuzzball, and I just want to hug it forever. Unfortunately, being harmless and lovable is inadequate as a defense mechanism in this wasteland, and that means Renopila is at the bottom of the food chain. It's an easy meal for predators and survivors alike, the latter of whom also value its hide. The locals refer to Renopila as a jerboa, but while it does look similar in some ways, it is clearly unrelated. The fact that it does not hop is a dead giveaway. In fact, while Renopila generally fits into the clade Glyries, it seems to share traits with both rodents and lagomorphs. In addition to being the cutest little companion in the desert, hours of close study and or cuddling have taught me that Renopila has an instinctive understanding of this land's weather patterns. When the weather is about to change, Renopila will suddenly start behaving differently. So taming Renopila does have practical uses that can justify its perch upon one's shoulder. Not that I need justification, but I'll take whatever excuse I can get. Scutinfora putus is a fast-flying insect that comes in two varieties, visually distinct only in the red or green markings on its exoskeleton. Biologically and behaviorally, they are practically the same. The only real difference between the two is the resource they gather in the expandable sacs on their backs. Scutinfora with green markings gather water, and Scutinfora with red markings gather oil. This unique ability makes Scutinfora a target for both the desert's natural predators and human survivors. Finding a green Scutinfora at the right time could prove to be life-saving, and survivors can use the oil produced by red Scutinfora for a wide variety of purposes. Like many of the insects on the island, Scutinfora cannot be tamed. Beyond the resources obtained while hunting it, survivors will find no use for it. Kairuku Waitaki is an amazingly docile and friendly creature to everything but fish. Honestly, I'm not quite sure how Kairuku manages to stay populated across the island's colder climes, with the many predators stalking these frozen lands. It is weak and only has one small defensive trait, Suspended in Kairuku blubber are small, dense particles that act as a light form of armor. Adding to Kairuku's problems, a clever survivor discovered that refining Kairuku blubber, concentrating the particles in it, can yield a natural form of the same polymer utilized in advanced tribes' manufacturing processes. This has caused many tribes to hunt Kairuku extensively, a practice colloquially known as Kairu clubbing. There is no reason to tame Kairuku for combat, since they are useless at it. Still, Kairuku are regularly tamed for their cuteness and friendly nature, and the fact that their bodies run extremely hot. Just standing near Kairuku can help a survivor stay warm through long, harsh nights on the icebergs. A smaller relative of Sarcosuchus, Caprosuchus paludentium, is a water-based carnivore, primarily found lurking among the island's swamps. A naturally fast runner that is even faster in the water, it is a solitary hunter that picks off small to medium creatures, especially those isolated from their pack. When attacking, Caprosuchus uses two main tactics. First, it patiently waits below the water surface, and when the target is sufficiently close by, will perform a lateral jump that it uses to quickly close distance with its prey and drag it underwater. Secondly, it attacks the prey's vital areas specifically to drain its stamina. These two techniques effectively prevent most creatures from escaping Caprosuchus once an assault has begun. Survivors are generally split about the usefulness of Caprosuchus. Some love its speed, both in and out of the water, essentially making it among the fastest, small-sized, all-terrain mounts when travelling through the wetlands. Others do not like how relatively frail Caprosuchus is and do not think its high speed and ensnaring attacks make up for this shortcoming. Carcinus versatus is the giant cousin of modern crab species, with long, spindly limbs that remind me of the Japanese spider crab and a hard, stony shell. It is much more agile than its smaller brethren, 
but even more noticeable are its pincer claws. In an extraordinary display of dexterity, Carquinus is able to wield each claw independently and precisely. This allows it to trap multiple targets in its vice-like grip, or hold an enemy in one claw while it smashes a second foe with the other. Many survivors have found Carquinus to be an excellent war steed, as it can snatch enemy riders from their mounts or grab and throw smaller creatures. However, its ability to leap to great heights and its swiftness relative to its size also makes it useful in caravans. While Kentrosaurus ethiopicus is considerably smaller than its close relative, Stegosaurus regium, it is much more formidable in matters of self-defense. In fact, it is arguably the pound-for-pound -pound champion of not only the Stegosaurus, but when encountered in close-knit fighting packs, ranks atop the island's herbivorous dinosaurs in general. Thanks to its wickedly sharp defensive spikes, any creature that attacks Kentrosaurus is likely to be reversely wounded in turn, and it is capable of piercing even the thickest of hides and armors when it goes on the offensive. I have personally witnessed the Kentrosaurus fell much larger predators in a single such impaling maneuver. Underestimating Kentrosaurus can be a fatal mistake, particularly when it's in a herd. When traveling in numbers, Kentrosaurus seems to grow much more aggressive, increasing the range at which it will defend its territory. Survivors have seen little success in their attempts to ride Kentrosaurus, owing to its spikes and hot-headed temperament. However, a tamed herd of Kentrosaurus can effectively defend a compound and take on larger carnivores. Once impaled by its attack, the Kentrosaurus slams the attacker onto the ground continuously, helping to turn the tide of a pitched battle. Xenomyzon luminosus is one of the most poisonous aquatic species I've ever encountered. While its trademark glowing tail makes it easy to spot and identify, those luminescent glands are also where it produces and stores a debilitating poison. Xenomyzon has developed a particular fondness for blood, and whenever possible, it will attempt to latch onto human subjects. Once it does, it injects a poison for which there are only two cures, a specialized antidote or time. I would not recommend the latter. While Xenomyzon cannot be brought to heal, some survivors have stored them in fish baskets for other uses. This keeps the subject alive and contained, but not properly tamed. It is difficult to be angry with Hementoria Letus, despite its rather terrible nature. The creature has practically no intelligence and just attaches to any nearby living flesh in an attempt to drain that creature's blood. Removing Hementoria requires precision blade work or access to an open flame. Both of these can be nearly as dangerous to the host as to the leech itself. Once Hementoria attaches to a host, it drains blood at a rapid pace and the host experiences hunger, loss of health, and lowered stamina. Some hementoria are also carriers for a dangerous disease I've dubbed swamp fever, which persists beyond the leech's own lifespan. Few creatures on the island are transmitters for this disease, and it can ultimately be cured with a rare medicine. While hementoria is not intelligent enough to be tamed, it is always useful to keep a few around for antidotes and fishing lures. When processed properly, Hementoria venom can be made into a powerful anti-venom. Leedsichthys conviviambrosia is probably the largest fish in the waters around the island. Its meat is also extremely succulent, a surprise given its size. It is often traded with the same value as prime meat, and colloquially called prime fish. Of course, not all Leedsichthys meat is this high quality, but most of it is. While the demand for Leedsichthys meat is high, the fish is notoriously difficult to track and hunt. Between its large size, powerful attacks, incredible speed when it turns to flee, and humankind's general ineptitude on open water, actually killing a lead sickthus is one of the island's more difficult tasks. The hunt for an extremely elusive breed of the fish, the fabled great albino lead sickthus, has been known to drive otherwise sensible men and women mad with obsession, as if all evil were visibly personified and made practically assailable in this one creature. Despite its large size and the fact that it may well be strong enough to carry heavy loads, 
leads Sixthis does not appear to be intelligent enough to tame. Nevertheless, some large tribes keep an enormous pen with a few lead Sixthis trapped inside for cultivating purposes, as bits of prime fish can be repeatedly scraped off the gargantuan beast without killing it. Leopluridon magicus is a mid-sized ocean creature, typically between 20 and 25 feet long. I've yet to directly encounter one myself, but from the tales other tribes have shared, it compares to no other on the island. The rumours indicate that this beautiful creature has magical properties. However, the sightings are so rare, it's hard to decipher old tribes' tales from the underlying truth. They say that Leopluridon is an elusive creature that can harness its magical powers to retreat from predators or aggressors of any kind but the beekeeping tribes claim that their honey is so sweet that not even the Leopluridon could resist. Leopluridon is rumoured to bring good fortune to those adventurous enough to tame it. With the Leopluridon by their side, tribes have apparently managed to obtain treasure beyond their wildest dreams. Supposedly, even after you've gained its favour, it remains incredibly aloof and will eventually use its abilities to escape even the strictest of captivity. Lystrosaurus amica fidelis is a small herbivore, common to much of the island. Only about two feet long, it is not high on the food chain and eats small plant life. The island's poisonous insects seem to have little effect on Lystrosaurus. Despite being among the island's tinier herbivores, Lystrosaurus is an incredibly resilient survivor. It recovers its torpor and health much faster than most creatures, which makes rendering a Lystrosaurus unconscious a rather difficult affair. Not surprisingly, Lystrosaurus is an extremely loyal pet once tamed. It's a very fast learner, so it gains experience much more quickly than most other creatures. Additionally, its presence nearby appears to inspire allies, making them learn more rapidly as well. Thusly, Lystrosaurus is an excellent addition to any tribe's hunting party. Seeing the likes of Mammothus Steinkaput alongside dinosaurs is still strange. This behemoth towers over many creatures on the island and doesn't seem to fear anything but the Tyrannosaurus. I've seen them stomp would-be predators out of their way. Mammoths can grab and throw things with their powerful trunks and manage a fearsome trumpeting roar with them as well. At first, I wondered how herds of mammoths were able to find enough plant life to graze on, but then I saw them sweeping up thatch and foliage with their tusks and stomping branches out of trees. Mammoths generally thrive in colder areas and have a herd mentality. They must spend much of their time travelling between the mountain's cold summit and more lush base, and maybe their herds are the reason why the summits are so barren. Mammothus steinkaput is a difficult beast to domesticate. Not because they are inherently stubborn, but because knocking one out to begin the taming process takes great effort. Once tamed, however, mammoths are one of the only creatures on the island that can uproot trees without shattering them, and their trunks are strong enough to lift and carry survivors and other smaller creatures. Lately, survivors have been saddling up their mammoths to ride in tandem. The more clever riders have even been outfitting their mammoth saddles with war drums, it turns out that drum solos from Mammoth Back can really boost your tribe mate's spirits. Draconis aragellus appears to be directly related to the stealthy Draconis obscurum. Their stature, gait, and ability to dive through the air are all similar. However, where Draconis obscurum scaled cavern walls to gain the high ground, Draconis aragellus takes a more bombastic approach. In the middle of its hind feet, Draconis aurigellus's bones form a hollowed-out cylindrical shape that acts as a combustion chamber, which it fills with an explosive gas. When ignited, this gas propels it upwards, letting it jump in the air multiple times. From there, it can create a smaller burn in said chamber to hover in place or dive at its prey. Like the icy variant of Draconis vipera, Draconis aurigellus can slow down its foes with its frigid breath, though it's able to take this one step further and freeze its prey solid. Perhaps that's because it's used to living in the tundra environment on the surface, as opposed to a desert. As a mount, Draconis aurigellus can carry multiple adult humans without losing any of its impressive mobility, and its freezing breath makes it a good choice in combat. 
Whether you're looking to hunt, do battle, or just travel with ease, it makes for an excellent companion. Here is another example of a creature that seems to have evolved beyond its historical traits. Everything points to this being a saltwater ray, but Manta Mobula has developed the ability to swim into the island's rivers and shallows, as well as through the open ocean. Perhaps there were originally two types of ray on the island before, but years of interbreeding combined their lineage. Normally docile, Manta Mobula is a carnivore, only in that it naturally consumes plankton. Fortunately, Manta Mobula is usually not aggressive, unless encroached. Its tail is incredibly sharp and can pierce through thick hide and armour with ease. While not the fastest swimmer around the island, Manta Mobula is among the deadliest of small ocean mounts. Tribes who value striking power over speed often keep large schools of Manta to ride. Its capability to briefly leap out of water provides it a showy tactic for avoiding combat as well. A quick jab through the heart of an unsuspecting survivor can easily take them by surprise. Thusly, many tribes use it as an escort for their slower cargo-carrying swimmers. The existence of a creature such as Impusa disapulus is both fascinating and frightening. Not only is Impusa the only recorded insect to have developed an opposable digit, allowing it to grip objects and use tools, but it possesses a level of intelligence that is unrivaled among non-human species. I have even found clear patterns in the sounds Impusa makes when communicating with its own kind, as though it is actually using some kind of dialect. I would love to study these interactions in depth, but observing Impusa up close is extremely dangerous. Its size, intelligence, and ability to pounce on its prey from a great distance means that one could be quickly swarmed and killed upon detection. Caution is recommended. Though a dangerous task, successfully taming Impusa can prove highly beneficial. Its unique claws allow it to wield melee weapons like spears or pikes in battle and use tools while harvesting resources. Megalania murispeed is among the largest creatures found throughout the island's complicated cave networks. Reaching up to three metres long, it can traverse vertically up cave walls with little difficulty thanks to its powerful claws. Fortunately, Megalania's size means it is unlikely to sneak up on anyone. Unfortunately for Spelunkers, it is an aggressive and dangerous creature nonetheless. Like other Varanidae, Megalania is a venomous creature. Its poison is slow-acting, but will drain the victim's effective strength and health until death, unless cured by a rare antidote. That said, the Megalania's prey are usually ripped apart well before they succumb to the poison's long-term effects. The rare ability of Megalania to effortlessly climb sheer environmental walls makes it a highly sought-after mount. While it is by no means the fastest, strongest, or toughest mount, the manner in which it can effortlessly scale mountains, clamber up barricades, hide in trees, or upside down, ensures it will always have a place in any tribe's stables. Megaloceros latus coronum is a very skittish herbivore, found mostly in the forests and mountains of the island. Because of its large size, its fraught demeanour would be strange in any other place. But Megaloceros knows how fierce the predators of the island are, and that it is safer to flee from them than to risk its life in a fight. The antlers of Megaloceros are very large, and make for an excellent source of keratin. This, of course, makes it a valuable resource. Unfortunately, Hunting Megaloceros is not easy because of their quick speed and ability to bound over most obstacles. Megaloceros is a jack-of-all-trades creature, and many who ride it value its versatility. It is decently powerful, and its resilience, speed, and ability to jump often come in handy. Finally, the male Megaloceros charging horn attack tends to cause targets to bleed, decreasing their health, stamina, and speed until healed. Were it not restricted to the waters, Carcharodon ultramegalodon would be one of the most dangerous creatures on the island. As powerful and dangerous as the Tyrannosaurus is on land, Megalodon is near its equal in the water. In addition, it has a speed advantage over any non-aquatic creature when submerged. Megalodons need large quantities of food to sustain themselves. So, 
they attack most creatures immediately on sight. Smaller fish are the sole exception I've seen. I believe this is because they cost more energy for megalodons to catch than the predator would gain. Having access to the resources and treasures hidden deep within the ocean is near impossible without a domesticated sea creature. The megalodon, though difficult to domesticate, proves to be very useful when exploring the deep sea. It's not the most efficient swimmer, but it should be able to protect your cargo should you find yourself in a hostile encounter. Much like the island's other large theropods, Megalosaurus noctodominus is an aggressive cave carnivore that should not be taken lightly. Unlike most of the other theropods, it is a primarily nocturnal creature. As dawn approaches, Megalosaurus begins looking for a secluded place to spend the day sleeping in relative safety. Conversely, if disturbed during the day, Megalosaurus is significantly more sluggish. Either way, however, its primary combat tactic is to bite onto its target, then lock its jaw shut in an iron grip. Only larger creatures can hope to break free once Megalosaurus locks its jaw. The creature then proceeds to gnaw on its prey until death. It's a terrifying, grisly spectacle to watch, and a formidable tactic for a tribe to employ against more nimble opponents. While Megalosaurus is not the most powerful theropod, it is still highly sought after by night raiders. Due to its nocturnal nature, Megalosaurus becomes much more formidable at night, dodging attacks, conserving stamina, and attacking more accurately, to name a few of its enhanced talents. Meganeura quadpenna is an especially large species of dragonfly. Actually, it is a type of griffinfly, an extinct species of invertebrate that looked similar to dragonflies. Like most griffinflies, Meganeura is carnivorous, but it is typically not aggressive towards humans unless provoked or challenged for food. It lives primarily in the wetter, heavier, wooded areas, such as the jungles. Meganeura is a natural predator of most of the smaller insects on the island. Though not often aggressive, Meganeura will not turn down a free meal. They quickly appear in large numbers to scavenge off the victims of Pulmonoscorpius, rendered unconscious and unable to defend themselves. Of course, the insects do have to avoid the Pulmonoscorpius itself. I have noticed it is unwise to disturb a flock of feeding Meganeura. The size of the insects on the island confounds me. The way these creatures diffuse oxygen should limit their size, but Meganeura and other bugs seem to be able to advance beyond this restraint. If there is more oxygen in the air, this could explain Meganeura's growth. Megatherium formipava is one of the larger mammals on the island. This is most shocking because it is essentially a giant sloth. If you crossbred it with an elephant and a bear. Because of its size and girth, the Megatherium is uncommonly resistant to being knocked unconscious. Despite primarily being a herbivore, a typical Megatherium is very intent on consuming the island's many insects. It is particularly adept at removing their insides without damaging much of the shell, maximizing extraction of chitin. The otherwise slow and peaceful Megatherium becomes faster and aggressive in the presence of these creatures. Megatherium is an incredibly useful creature to tame. So long as you don't intend to fight other tribes, its enormity, high resistance to torpor, and voracious attitude toward insects and arachnids makes it ideal for farming large quantities of chitin from the bugs of the island, or simply defending against them. Mesopithecus amicifer is an omnivorous monkey species, primarily inhabiting the island's jungles. It is smaller than a human, but can scurry about the same speed. It does not appear to be aggressive, unlike its relative, the Gigantopithecus, but is rather very shy towards humans, likely due to their much larger size and lack of hairy exterior. Due to their skittish nature, they can be difficult to tame. They can be hand-fed if you are patient, but stick too close to them for too long, and they'll get spooked and run away. A common pet, Mesopithecus, is very easy to keep fed. It will eat nearly any fruit harvested on the island. Mesopithecus is most often used as a social companion, as it cannot carry enough to be a beast of burden, is not large enough to be ridden, and is not particularly good for combat. It is, however, 
quite effective at vocally warning of incoming intruders and pelting them with copious amounts of tossed fecal matter. Nomadic tribes have also managed to teach Mesopithecus to open locked doors when pillaging. Microraptor narrolongus is one of the smallest non-avian dinosaurs on the island. Incredibly fast for its size, Microraptor is a voracious carnivore. Aggressive towards anything regardless of size, Microraptor fancies itself an apex predator. It will attack humans on sight, especially if it's not alone. When hunting, Microraptor's speed is only one of its assets. While not quite capable of sustained flight, its wings allow it to stay aloft for several seconds while jumping. This allows Microraptor to attack its prey's vulnerable areas, as well as search for small river fish. Notable, the creature also tends to use this ability to knock oblivious humans off of their mounts. While not a powerhouse against armed enemies, Microraptor is particularly suited to dismounting enemy riders. Microraptor's natural tendency to attack weaker creatures means they can ignore the mount while attacking the rider with leaps of fury, bearing a strong resemblance to its relative, the naked mole rat. Heterocephalus magnus is a gentle giant that digs for plants and fungi with its imposing front teeth. While foraging, it often uncovers precious resources inadvertently but survivors should claim them with caution, as this triggers an aggressive response. When threatened, heterocephalus rolls up into a ball to shield itself with the armoured plates on its back, much like an armadillo. It then rolls around like an oversized bowling ball, smashing through rocks, walls, and hopefully its aggressor. While hardly a ferocious war beast, heterocephalus is an effective transport that can carry up to three passengers. In theory, it could also be a siege weapon, as its rolling attack can dent even metal. Fortunately, most survivors use a special saddle that deploys a protective canopy when it starts spinning, which not only keeps them from getting squished, but provides extra protection to the rider and mount alike. Morellotops dromedaria seems to be a relative of both the Morellodon and Ceratops genuses, which in itself is rather strange. On top of that, it has developed the ability to store water in its humps like a camel. This makes it a critical part of the desert's food chain, as it provides predators with both food and hydration. When survivors discovered how to tap into the water in the Morellotops' humps without harming it, the docile creature became the desert's essential pack animal. Not only can it carry a good amount of weight, but it can provide survivors with a large mobile water source that can mean the difference between life and death on any given journey. Morellotops has limited options when it comes to self-defense, so I would not recommend taking one into combat. However, so long as survivors don't forget to let Morellotops stop by a well every now and then, they will find the creature an invaluable companion. Until recently, I believed the Megalodon to be the greatest of the ocean predators. Then I discovered Mosasaurus suspirita in the deeps. Not quite as fast, but much larger and stronger, the Mosasaurus rules the darkest waters off the island. Growing up to 15 metres long, Mosasaurus is larger than almost every other aquatic creature I've encountered thus far. Mosasaurus is a deep-sea marine lizard, which spends all of its time far beneath the water's surface. It is without a doubt one of the most fearsome creatures of the island and can certainly be considered among the ocean's apex predators. Mosasaurus has proven to be an excellent tame for the most advanced tribes. Due to its sheer size and power, you will often find tribes with bases and defences built upon a Mosasaur's large platform saddle. Having one with you as an escort is probably one of the best oceanic defences available. Moschop Cebu Mutante in the wild is a lazy, cowardly creature that typically lives in the island's forests, primarily making its home among the great redwoods of the western regions. It survives by being extremely flexible in its eating habits and completely averse to fighting. It never starves, since it can eat just about anything. It runs at the slightest provocation, but is still often preyed upon. What makes musk chops particularly interesting is what it can be trained to do with its eating habits. With a versatile palate and tough teeth, musk chops can be tamed for a unique ability. 
Over time, it can be accurately taught exactly which things to gnaw, increasing the likelihood of harvesting the specific resource its master desires. For example, teach it to prioritize chewing prime meat, and prime meat will be easier to harvest from the flesh it consumes, likewise for rare plants' materials, and so forth. Just don't expect moss chops to protect you, though. Even after taming, it will quickly flee when enemies are nearby. Regardless of being fed well, increasing its strength, or how much affection you shower on it, moss chops retains its inherent cowardly nature. Its lack of combat might deter the use of this companion, but the ability to ride moss chops while making use of its diverse harvesting is a rare treat. Like its smaller relatives, Lymantria sporamus survives by draining plants and vegetables of their nutrients. Given the desolate nature of the region, that makes its options rather limited. But fortunately, its relationship with the desert's plants is symbiotic. In addition to pollinating them, the spores it releases help nourish the harsh desert plants. When attacked, the slow-moving Lymantria immediately takes to the air and flies almost straight up while releasing spores. While the spores are nutritious to most plants, they are highly poisonous to most other organisms. Lymantria is occasionally used as a one-man flying mount, but its ability to produce silk and spores is often considered more valuable due to its slow flight speed. Its silk can be weaved into heat-dispersing cloth, and its spores gathered for fertilizer or poison. Its saving grace as a mount is its ability to release spores mid-flight, allowing it to act as a primitive bomber during sieges. The origins of the nameless remain a mystery, but wherever they came from, these vicious creatures are nothing to scoff at, as they are rarely found alone. Common nameless act in a subservient role to their pack's alpha and will quickly heed its call to battle. Though savage in nature, the Nameless are deceptively intelligent. When hurt, they burrow underground to recover and protect themselves from further damage. Fortunately, they are highly susceptible to damage and burns from charge-based light sources, and exploiting this weakness can save a survivor's life. All attempts to pacify a Nameless have failed. Each one has an extremely powerful bond with its pack leader, and for survivors, it might as well be unbreakable. Onychonycterus specuncola is one of the few omnivores I've seen on the island. They seem to live primarily off the mushrooms and moss within the caves, but they attack almost any non-insect on site. They avoid Titanoboa whenever possible, which leads me to believe the snake to be a natural predator of Onychonycterus. While flying in the dark caves would be difficult for any creature, Onychonycterus' ability to use echolocation has allowed it to adapt perfectly. It can be found idly flying around the caves, as often as it can be found hanging from bits of the cave ceilings. Not large enough to be used as mounts, and not strong enough to carry much, Onychonycterus still functions well as a guard animal. Whether protecting a vacant home or members of a tribe, their relatively vicious nature has its uses. Found along the island's many inland waterways, Lutra Peloso have become exceptionally adept at hunting and foraging. This species of otter has to be particularly cunning because of its diminutive size and fierce competition for its preferred food source, fish. It is not a creature that excels at combat and would not naturally pose as an intimidating threat to any predators. Finding packs of river otters is simple enough. They are distinguished by their elongated bodies, bushy tails, and webbed feet. Their trusting and inquisitive nature ensures they are often hunted for their lustrous fur, but many prefer to tame them to become trusted companions. There are few creatures which provide the companionship that Lutra Peloso does. Rather than travelling beside you, it would prefer to comfortably rest on your back, providing insulation. Once domesticated, it can be told to harvest fish on demand, with a specific goal in mind from the fish that it consumes. The otter has a knack for foraging silica pearls, and can even yield a slight chance at finding black pearls within. Oviraptor philodotor is a small to medium-sized carnivore, common in the jungles and beaches of the island. Despite being a carnivore, Oviraptor's main source of food is eggs, which it steals from nests. Unlike any other creature, 
Oviraptor seems to be able to surreptitiously steal these eggs, usually without attracting the attention of an irate mother. In an incredible feat of natural selection, Oviraptor seems to emit a chemical pheromone that affects many creatures as an aphrodisiac. Mated creatures are much more likely to create new eggs while Oviraptor is around, which allows the Oviraptor to go about its business unperturbed. Too small to fight or ride, Oviraptor is still one of the more commonly tamed creatures on the island. Its pheromone ensures an increased stream of eggs from nearby mated wild creatures for breeding, eating, or cooking kibble. Oviraptor will autonomously do the dirty work of stealing eggs from other tribes or wild dinos on your behalf without attracting unwanted attention. They also make quite adorable sounds, so many children simply like to keep them around as rather strange companions. Since arriving on the island, I have encountered dozens of fascinating creatures whose behaviour has never been studied or documented. And also sheep. Granted, Ovis Arkham is quite different from the modern domesticated sheep, and even from wild sheep species such as Ovis orientalis. The unique markings on its face give it a striking appearance, and the male's horns possess a unique shape that is unlike any other species in the Ovis genus. As one might expect, Ovis stands little chance against the island's many predators. Like the dodo, its continued survival in the face of these challenges is a mystery. Some survivors have found herds of Ovis to be useful in farm life. Their wool can be repeatedly safely shorn with the proper tools, and cooked lamb chops are a popular dish among some tribes, as is their hypernutritious mutton. Every now and then, a survivor with a sense of humour will attempt to utilise Ovis as a mount, although the joke becomes significantly less funny once their slow Ovis is run down by a pack of raptors. One tribe has grown particularly attached to Ovis, perhaps uncomfortably so. I don't know the tribe's actual name, but I refer to them as sheep lovers. Pachycephalosaurus is a bit of a conundrum. It is a very passive, even friendly herbivore, common to much of the island. At the same time, it is one of the most dangerous herbivores that I have yet encountered on the island. Its charging headbutt is a display of sheer physical power and can kill much more quickly than you might think. While Pachycephalosaurus is generally friendly, it has a short temper. Its fight-or-flight response always seems to choose fight. The Pachycephalosaurus becomes extremely aggressive once attacked. Additionally, it is an incredibly fast sprinter, so escaping from an enraged Pachycephalosaurus is very difficult. Pachycephalosaurus is an excellent battle mount for those who want to ride a smaller, nimble combatant into the fray. Because of its particular musculature, it cannot effectively carry large quantities of resources. It can, however, move with brief, magnificent bursts of speed, and its headbutt is simply devastating. Pachyrhinosaurus midisora is a medium-sized herbivore, found almost everywhere but the island's mountains. It is generally calm and ignores all other nearby creatures unless it is attacked. Pachyrhinosaurus possesses a particularly unique survival skill. When threatened, its massive nasal boss releases a chemical into the air that calms other nearby creatures, making them less likely to attack it. Affected creatures are sometimes hungry enough to ignore the effect, and humans seem immune to it. Conversely, it can seemingly invert this phenomenon at will and coerce creatures into attacking it. Pachyrhinosaurus is an excellent starting mount for anyone new to taming. It is fairly easy to train, can carry enough to be a simple pack animal, and is not as deadly as some of the larger herbivores. Additionally, Pachyrhinosaurus can release its unique chemical on command to protect itself and its rider from nearby predators, or draw attention if desired making it a potential lifesaver in a pinch. Paraceratherium gigamicus is a massive, long-necked herbivore that inhabits some of the island's grasslands. It resembles a gigantic horse-slash-rhinoceros hybrid, but is over twice the size of either. Paraceratherium is a very peaceful and friendly creature. Barring some surprises yet in store for me, I can safely say that Paraceratherium is among the largest mammals on the island. 
While its size means that Paraceratherium can provide an incredible amount of food, it also makes it dangerous when hunted. A beast of burden second to the Brontosaurus, Paraceratherium is an excellent worker and is sufficient in size to support a platform saddle upon which structures can be built. It is a naturally friendly animal and is not afraid of humans. However, despite its normally calm demeanour, when it or its owner is provoked by aggression, the Paraceratherium can quickly become a real threat to the attacker and will use its girth to its advantage in combat. Paraceratherium amphibio has one of the more interesting adaptations of any creature I've seen on the island. Like all parasaur, it has a signature crest on its head. Very docile at first, I've been able to approach the creature without disturbing it. If startled, however, the creature can vocalise a distress call to the surrounding area that warns of danger. Paraceratherium appears to be low on the food chain and is hunted by everything, creatures and humans alike which explains its skittish nature. It is a good source of meat and hide, if you can manage to keep up with it long enough to kill it. Despite being what most tribes consider a relatively useless creature to tame, I once met an interesting woman who had tamed an entire herd of them. She informed me that many overlooked the creature's potential. She even graciously gifted me a fancy saddle to put on my own Paraceratherium one day. As a relatively simple creature to domesticate, Paraceratherium is commonly one of the first mounts a tribe will be able to acquire. Its ability to run relatively fast for lengthy intervals makes it a solid mode of medium-range transportation, though it has almost no ability to defend itself or its rider in a traditional sense. Smaller creatures, however, appear to be frightened by the horn of Paraceratherium, although it doesn't do much damage. It also has decent weight-bearing capabilities, which could prove useful for nomadic tribes as they work to establish a presence on the island. Among the bottom of the island's dinosaur food chain is a small herbivore called Pegomastex fructorator. It is content to spend all day alone, gorging itself on far more food than you might reasonably expect for a creature of its tiny stature. Its beak appears perfectly evolved for collecting food from plants while avoiding the indigestible fibrous strands. Pegomastix is likely to ignore any nearby creature and continue foraging, unless it's attacked, at which point it turns into a very aggressive, though rather unthreatening opponent, shrieking and whooping far above its actual threat level. You would expect a creature this small and weak to live in flocks, but Pegomastix seems to be fairly solitary in nature. While not pretty and far too small to ride, Tribes often keep pegomastics around as a kind of farming aid. Its skill at scavenging means that it collects an extraordinary quantity of seeds and berries, while also handily gathering the rare flowers, mushrooms, and other ingredients necessary to cook up unusual concoctions. The much larger ancestor of water birds like the stork or pelican, Pelagornis myosinus, shares many traits with its modern-day brethren. However, it seems to spend far more time hunting for fish over the open deep sea. In fact, I have rarely spotted a wild Pelagornis anywhere near the coasts of the main island, as it prefers to rest its wings by paddling on the ocean's surface rather than waddling along the island's beaches. Perhaps this behaviour is a result of its survival instincts. The early Miocene was a post-dinosaur epic, after all, and Pelagornis would not be accustomed to such predators. Considering how quickly it flees from humans, one can hardly blame its caution. Because of its ability to fly, walk, and surface swim, a tamed Pelagornis is one of the island's most versatile mounts. But this comes at a cost. The same webbed feet that allow Pelagornis to serenely manoeuvre along the ocean's surface prevent it from carrying prey off the ground, which may limit its appeal to some survivors. Pheomia ignavis is another of the island's generally docile herd animals. They are small enough that almost any predator can bring them down, but large enough to provide plenty of meat. Were it not for the protection of the herd and their instinct to run from any predator, these would almost certainly be hunted to extinction. Pheomia's tusks and trunk make it especially suited to scavenging plant life from the ground. It uses its tusks to dig up loose plant life then uses its stubby trunk to scoop the foliage into its mouth. Adult pheomia often dig up food for their young, 
and watching a baby Fiomi attempt to use its trunk can be quite amusing. While it is completely possible to ride a Fiomi around, they are a meagre choice. They work very well, however, as pack mules. If you feed the Fiomi a stimberry, it serves as a laxative in the creature's digestive system. Knowing this, tribal communities often keep a herd of these as livestock to produce mass quantities of fertilizer. Among the most mysterious of all flying creatures, much of what is known about the phoenix exists in legends which have been told through generations. These myths have often changed through the passing of time, but one constant is the belief that fire represents cleansing and renewal. The phoenix embodies this process through its everlasting cycle of death and renewal. Extreme heat waves in the desert seem to initiate the rise of the phoenix, while the end of this so-called superheat precipitated the creature's reversion into ashes. While the phoenix seems ambivalent to most wildlife, if provoked, its ferocity is evident in its ability to set targets aflame with a single bite. Attempting to pacify a phoenix is, quite literally, playing with fire. The phoenix must be continually set ablaze in order to be tamed. I've seen many turned into dust and ash in the attempt. After it has been pacified, the phoenix will regain its vitality when it is aflame. Although its compact size prevents the phoenix from being ridden, its aggressive inflaming has proved to be invaluable in battle. Plus, it can quickly roast up tasty cooked meat and refine raw ores at any time as a living furnace. Mega Piranha Magnid Morsis is a carnivorous fish found fairly commonly in the rivers and ponds of the island. Its bite is incredibly powerful. I've even seen them break through the armoured turtles of the island. Mega Piranha has one of the strongest bites pound for pound of any creature on the island. When encountering a Mega Piranha, be on the lookout for the rest of the school. No one Mega Piranha is an overwhelming threat, but their tendency to swarm prey can make short work of much larger and stronger creatures. Any given Mega Piranha is easy to kill, but killing the entire school can be a daunting task. Like some of the other creatures on the island, a tamed mega piranha is best suited as a guard. Their high metabolism makes them require more food than many other creatures, but they are very adept at hunting their own food, particularly the coelacanths. Elasmosaurus remus pisa is typically found in the deep oceans and has a strange role in the oceanic food chain. It almost exclusively hunts the smaller creatures in the waters, leaving most even moderately large creatures alone. The sheer size of the Elasmosaurus means that the quantity of food it must eat to sustain itself is nothing short of enormous. Elasmosaurus is a formidable fighter. Aside from the Megalodon, I have only ever seen two creatures bring down an Elasmosaurus, a Mosasaurus and human beings. Though I will admit, I have yet to thoroughly explore the staggeringly deep underwater caverns surrounding the island. Much like the Brontosaurus on land, Elasmosaurus is an excellent way to transport large quantities of goods over water. These powerful creatures are in fact so large that they can be used as mobile water bases. Ambitious tribes sometimes build bunkers right onto the backs of Elasmosaurus instead of building cargo ships. The first marsupial I've encountered on the island is the Prosoptodon vivancurus. Standing nearly three metres tall, it is among the largest jumping creatures I've heard of. It is a fairly peaceful herbivore that will immediately flee when aggressed upon. One of the Prosoptodon's most unique features is its pouch. Unlike many pouched marsupials, Prosoptodon's pouch is relatively dry and has little in the way of sticky or oily fluids. I assume this is good for the joey, but I have not figured out exactly why yet. Its other unique feature, powerful hind legs, can knock back aggression much larger in stature. Prosoptodons show great precision when leaping, as if they can accurately target the landing without fail. I've seen them effortlessly hop and land from heights that would flatten other creatures. It seems Prosoptodon's knack for carrying things has increased its load-bearing capacity. Prosoptodon's dry pouch makes it an excellent beast of burden that can carry far more than any other creatures of its size. Additionally, it appears to provide an optimal environment for nourishing babies, so much that upon maturing, 
they have even more vigour. Pteranodon wyvernus is a large pterosaur, capable of flying more quickly than any creature I have witnessed on this island thus far. It seems to have relatively poor stamina in comparison to its quick speed, however, making frequent pit stops on the beaches before taking off again. While other humans I've seen on the island still insist on calling it a pterodactyl, this is inaccurate. Pteranodon wyvernus' poor fighting and defensive skills mean they are likely to scavenge any number of dead animals rather than engage in dangerous combat with other creatures. They also flee at the slightest sign of trouble. Because of this, they are one of the most common creatures to be found darting across the island's skies. Pteranodons seem to be among the most popular flying companions from what I have witnessed, possibly because they are relatively easy to tame with a slingshot or bow. Mounting a pteranodon must be among the fastest and safest ways to get around the island, but it doesn't provide any measure of secrecy in comparison to travel on land through the dense foliage. I'm not sure why, but the giant scorpions I've seen on the island are far more disturbing than most of the dinosaurs. Rather than simply kill its prey, Pulmonoscorpius gigantus injects its victims with a tranquilizing poison, then eats its unconscious prey alive. This subspecies has a large pair of pincers that seem connected to the same toxin sacs as the tail. I've never seen another scorpion that has this adaptation, but I've never seen another scorpion that's larger than I am either. Trying to tame a monster like Pulmonoscorpius gigantus sounds like a crazy idea, but I suppose the ability to knock out a foe could come in handy. It could certainly make incapacitating some of the island's other creatures much easier. Pelovia maxima perfectly embodies the element of surprise. Though Nanictodopids such as Pelovia were once thought to be herbivores, I discovered that this creature is in fact a patient hunter of the most intelligent sort. After burrowing beneath the jungle floor, Pelovia enters a state of hibernation and can go extended periods without any food. When some unfortunate creature eventually wanders by, Pelovia bursts forth from the ground, tearing into its prey with its large canines before the victim can react. Though Pelovia is ill-suited to the life of a mount, its usefulness in staging an ambush or as a village guardian cannot be understated. With a tamed pack of Pelovia, one could assemble a literal organic minefield of deadly claws and teeth. However, any ambushes using Pelovia must be planned well in advance, as it will refuse to hibernate if it senses any threat nearby. From afar, it's hard to believe that Quetzalcoatlus is one of the largest avians on the island. It shares a similar silhouette with the Pteranodon and nests near the absolute highest peaks. Upon closer inspection, though, Quetzalcoatlus is an enormous creature of tremendous power. I find it strange that such a large, imposing beast would be so skittish. Unlike other creatures of its size, it is more likely to flee than fight. I suppose the decision to flee from any trouble keeps the species alive on an island with so many dangerous predators. But then how does it eat enough to sustain its massive size? Tamed Quetzalcoatlus have a very specific role on the island. Too slow to be an efficient local transport and too weak to be an effective warbird, the tribes I have encountered tend to employ it as a mass carrier. Quetzalcoatlus is primarily used by these masters of the skies to safely carry vast quantities of supplies, creatures, and human cargo from one base to another without tiring. Utah Raptor Prime is an incredibly aggressive subspecies of Utah Raptor found on the island. It tends to travel in small hunting packs, attacking smaller prey with its sharp teeth and enlarged foreclaws. When hunting in packs, the pack leader can vocalize a signal that acts as a battle cry. Be prepared to run or fight if you hear the call of the Utah Raptor. The pack will repeat the calls and attack with much greater intensity. One of the faster creatures on the island, Utah Raptor often uses their pack numbers to their advantage by swarming around their prey before it can react. The large curved talon on the second toe of this subspecies seems particularly suited for dealing significant damage. 
Utah Raptor Prime usually kill its prey with numerous slashing and biting attacks in rapid sequence. What the Utah Raptor lacks in size, it makes up for in ingenuity. Rather than chase down smaller creatures, Utah Raptor will pounce and pin its prey to the ground rather than chasing it around. Despite its normally aggressive nature, Utah Raptors have become one of the primary combat mounts for roaming bands of raiders, as well as scouts for larger collectives. Those who ride Utah Raptor claim they are difficult to tame, but then fiercely loyal. As a carnivore, once tamed, they require a steady stream of meat to sustain. Anywhere else, Canis Bargus's powerful muscles, wicked claws, and fearsome countenance would put it near the top of the food chain. Yet in these caves, this common lupine predator resides somewhere in the middle. That said, it is an intelligent hunter with an exceptional ability to adapt. For example, it has learned to utilize the zip lines that survivors have built as a means of travel, all on its own. <sighs> Remarkable. The strong legs of the Canis Bargast make it an effective mount for many survivors, particularly for long-distance travel. While other creatures outshine it when it comes to bursts of speed, its stamina and ability to climb across both natural vines and artificial zip lines makes it a highly versatile traveling companion. At home in the cavern's deepest chambers, reapers are towering, terrifying apex predators. Beyond overwhelming their prey with fangs and claws, reapers can burrow underground to set an ambush and fire acidic projectiles from their tails. Yet it is their macabre method of reproduction that is their most frightening feature. Bizarrely, a female reaper's tail doubles as a reproductive organ, but only when piercing human survivors. Once impregnated, the survivor carries the young reaper until it bursts from their chest in a grotesque, disturbing spectacle. If impregnated by a female reaper, I strongly urge that that survivor kill the embryo via exposure to radiation. However, there are rumours that reapers might imprint themselves on a survivor who possesses a reaper pheromone gland. This has led some mad survivors with dreams of riding on the back of a reaper to try seeing the gestation period through to the end. But that is extremely dangerous. Not to mention disgusting. Arguably the deadliest creature on the island, Tyrannosaurus dominum is a killing machine. Active mostly when hunting for food or defending its nest, a good plan is to avoid every Tyrannosaurus. It is pure power, from its stomp to its tail. It is not able to intimidate every foe with its roar, but upon hearing it, it might scare the poop out of you. Quite literally. Despite being a different subspecies of Tyrannosaurus, everyone I've met still refers to them as a Rex or a T-Rex. I've long since stopped trying to convince anyone, especially the few who I've encountered wearing Tyrannosaurus teeth as necklaces. Taming a Tyrannosaurus is without a doubt the goal for any warlord or warring tribe. Tyrannosaurus is a fierce battle companion. There is a reason Tyrannosaurus is considered the king of dinosaurs, or in this genus, the lord. Any tribe that manages to tame one has almost nothing to fear. Draconis Obscurum is a magnificent example of a predator that has flawlessly adapted to its environment. It is surrounded by cavern walls, so it developed powerful claws with which to scale them and colourful plumage on its anterior limbs that let it glide from perch to perch. But most dangerous of all, its active camouflage, which lets it fade into the shadows and stalk its prey undetected. It has even adapted to the Nameless and the Reapers. Draconis feathers will raise in warning when they are near, and this massive, elegant lizard seems to be the Reaper's only natural enemy. With its unparalleled mobility and undeniable power, Draconis Obscurum is a highly sought-after mount. Survivors who successfully bring one back from its nesting grounds will suddenly find these caverns much easier to traverse, and that their enemies have become their unsuspecting prey. Even its saddle and rider are affected by its active camouflage, so a survivor's enemies will never see them coming. Colossus Petrum is like no creature I have ever encountered. There is no biological or historical precedent for it. Its nearest relatives exist only in legend. 
mythical statues that could come to life, like the Golem of Prague. That makes it all the more dangerous. What survivor could possibly expect a seemingly benign rock formation to suddenly spring to life and attack them? Fortunately, Colossus Petrum's massive size makes it quite slow, so I would advise most survivors to flee immediately if encountering it in the wild. Colossus Petrum survives by slowly absorbing nearby minerals while in its dormant state, which consequently means that its body contains a wealth of metal ingots. If undisturbed, it can maintain this hibernation ad infinitum, but it will viciously attack anyone who encroaches upon its territory. A solitary creature, Colossus Petrum lives alone and will not even protect its own kind. If somehow tamed, Colossus Petrum could prove to be an invaluable asset, particularly in a siege. Only armor-piercing rounds or explosives can harm it at all, and it will handily smash through stone structures. Smilodon Brutalis is a solitary hunter, generally found in cold, lightly wooded areas. The island's mountains are the perfect habitat, as the mammal's fur keeps it safe from the bitter temperature. While its huge fangs are excellent for delivering death blows, the creature's claws can be just as deadly. Despite normally being a solitary creature, Smilodon Brutalis are not opposed to hunting in small packs. In fact, they have to do this to take down larger prey, such as mammoths. Enough saber-tooths can take down a Carnotaurus, perhaps even a Tyrannosaurus. Either way, Smilodon Brutalis should not be underestimated. While not as fast as raptors, there's no denying the saber-tooth's increased resilience and power. In addition, well-trained saber-tooth can be taught to use their claws to flay corpses. This may sound morbid, but it is among the best ways to quickly gather large quantities of hide from the giant beasts of the island. Fairly unremarkable by the island standards, Oncorhynchus grexlamia is a generally passive fish. Its main form of protection is swimming in a large school. Oncorhynchus does not like conflict, and generally swims away from anything larger than itself at very high speeds. Once provoked, however, Oncorhynchus becomes quite aggressive, along with its nearby brethren. It locks onto its prey with its long saber teeth and begins draining the creature's blood. This loss of blood is not too dangerous alone, but when a school of Oncorhynchus attack at once, their target quickly loses speed and stamina from blood loss drowning if it cannot breathe underwater. Like many of the smaller fish found on or around the island, Oncorhynchus cannot be tamed, but it is often herded and harvested for its resources. In particular, certain cuts of Oncorhynchus meat are considered to have superb quality and are often referred to as prime fish, used for specific high-end concoctions and taming the island's many piscivorous creatures. Among the island's swamp-based threats, Sarcosuchus excubitor is a lot like what you might expect from a giant crocodile, a patient killing machine. It spends much of its days lazily waiting in the water for prey to walk near. That said, it is not opposed to scurrying onto land and pressing the issue when hungry. A good tactic for escaping many predators is to jump into the water, as most are slow swimmers. This is a bad tactic for escaping a Sarcosuchus, obviously as they are actually faster in the water than they are on land. Whether in land or water, it utilises a well-rounded arsenal of attacks to display its prowess as a hunter. If it desires to grab a predator and spin into a death roll, quickly lunge forward for a surprise attack, or target a foe directly behind it, it is able to do so with extreme ease. Sarcosuchus is a ferocious creature that even causes the fearless piranha to flee at the sight of it. Despite being river-dwelling creatures, Sarcosuchus seem quite at ease in the oceans. More than a few fishing communities use them as mounts simply to help fight off megalodons or to gain better access to the resources found within the reefs. A highly hostile predator with a pack mentality, Chimerum odiosus has a voracious appetite and will quickly swarm anything that possesses its favourite delicacy. Charge. In fact, Charge light seems to be crucial to its survival. When in its presence, they are strong and aggressive, but without it, they are weaker and quicker to flee. Though distinct from any known species, Chimerium's appearance is a hideous pastiche of bats, 
and cephalopods. And as an unbiased professional, I have to say, I really hate these bloody things. Honestly. For better or worse, there is no known method of taming Chimerum odiosus. If one must confront these creatures, remember to do so away from any charged light sources, as an empowered Chimerum swarm can punch well above its weight class. Most commonly found in the upper chambers of the caverns, Microluminous Serenitus is at once elegant and adorable. As with its relatives, it is entirely peaceful and no threat to survivors. After close study, by which I mean very scientific bouts of cuddling, I found that it shares traits with both bovids and cervids. However, in the soft glow of its charge light, Microluminous Serenitus always gave me the impression that were it larger, it would be right at home pulling Artemis' chariot. An exceptionally well-mannered and huggable companion, Microluminous Serenitus is an excellent choice of pet for any survivor. Whether it is providing a source of charge light from your shoulder or playfully bounding up beside you, its presence is sure to brighten up your day. Cynomicrops bundae is a friendly and curious little pterosaur. It may approach and investigate unfamiliar creatures, but Cynomicrops does spook easily. When threatened, it will unfurl its wings to reveal daymatic eye spots in an attempt to confuse or scare predators away. Still, Cynomicrops seems to be a highly intelligent creature that craves social interaction. While it's normally curious and friendly, Cynomicrops' adorably oversized mouth turns into a deadly weapon at the slightest sight and smell of insects. Even alone, this cute little critter can take down insects far larger than itself. Unfortunately, this means that armor made from chitinous plates is going to trigger an attack response from the otherwise sweet-hearted pterosaur. Taming a Cynomicrops is fairly straightforward in theory. Just feed them without scaring them. Once tamed, they absolutely love travelling with their humans and prefer to cling to them whenever possible. Not only are they sociable, but they're fiercely protective once bonded. Any small creature approaching someone with a tame Cynomicrops will be met with its flashing eye spots and piercing shriek. That's usually enough to stun an undersized interloper. For such a small flyer, Cynomicrops can carry surprisingly heavy loads. It can even support the weight of a fully grown human adult, though it will struggle to gain altitude. Still, any creature companion that can double as a glider and parachute is invaluable for anyone traversing an arc, as long as they bring plenty of snacks for their new friend. Discovering Bubo Chinookus was a pleasant surprise. Owls are remarkable creatures, but they're not the type that could survive an extinction-level event on their own. Since it never strays from the patch of frozen tundra we encountered, I believe the obelisk was the key to its survival. Clearly a descendant of modern Strigidae, Bubo shares many traits with its smaller ancestors. For example, it excretes waste in the form of pellets, which make excellent fertilizer, and their large wings let them save energy during long, silent flights. They even hunt in the same way, by diving towards the ground to attack their prey with powerful talons. However, these talons also secrete a chemical with a high freezing point to slow down their prey, and they can even unleash this chemical in a wide cloud, temporarily freezing their foes. With its swift flying and frigid attacks, Bubo makes an excellent single rider support mount or scout. The latter is helped by its tremendous vision, which it can share with its rider via its antenna. Not only does this make enemies easier to see, but Bubo can also spot element veins with ease, even when they're underground. Among the few carnivores on the island that can match Tyrannosaurs in size, Spinosaurus aquarellica does not match its ferocity. Spinosaurus' four legs and large sail make it fairly swift on land and incredibly fast in the water. Its marvel is arguably the ability to change stances by going from quadruped to biped. The creature is visually distinguished by its spectacular sail. In my travels, I have seen many different and brightly coloured sails, as every Spinosaurus appears to have a slightly different palette. The one comforting fact about Spinosaurus is that it seems more at home near water than away from it. 
Although the creature is more powerful, faster, agile, and insatiable while in water, it tends to become less hostile as it gets farther from it. On one occasion, I only escaped a Spinosaurus by getting far enough from its lake home to make it simply lose interest. Spinosaurus is an incredibly well-rounded apex carnivore, faster than a Tyrannosaurus in water, and able to travel on land unlike a Megalodon, its all-terrain versatility may be unrivaled. Although its movement speed is slower in a biped stance, it gains considerable attacking strength and mobility in this form. For hunters who wish to have a well-rounded mount, Spinosaurus may be the ideal choice, if they can acquire one. Stegosaurus regium has approximately 16 paired rows of plates along its back, flanked by another smaller pair of six plates. This is contrary to the alternating rows on Stegosaurus fossils I've seen in museums. Not surprisingly, Stegosaurus uses the spines on its tail to defend itself. While not aggressive, Stegosaurus will come to the aid of another nearby Stegosaurus. This implies it to be a herd animal. Stegosaurus is commonly used as a safe way to transport large quantities of goods, and once you saddle one up, not even an Argentavis could knock you off that perch. A Stegosaurus can be trained to flex its back plates for different purposes, harden to shield it from attack, in a heavier alignment that deals crippling blows, or oriented more sharply to pierce armour. These various plate configurations also come in handy for stripping wood from trees, gathering thatch, or foraging for wild berries, respectively. Stegosaurus can knock back or impale with a whip of its spiky tail, keeping predators at bay or pinning them in place. Its spiked appendage also helps for gathering berries. Tapahara Imperator is a marvel to watch in the wild. It has astonishing agility compared to the island's other flyers, thanks in large part to the rudder-like fin that extends from its snout to the back of its skull. Initially, I thought the fin was simply composed of keratin, but closer inspection has led me to believe that it is actually some kind of sensory organ. Not only does it decrease Tapahara's turning radius even at high speeds, but it apparently provides Tapahara with extra information to help it fly through the air with unparalleled grace. I've even seen the Tapahara hover and strafe side to side in the air without moving forward at all. It's quite remarkable. The creature also makes effective use of razor-sharp claws to latch onto surfaces such as the trunks of tall trees, holding its position indefinitely. Warlike tribes appear to consider Tapahara the equivalent of a versatile rotor aircraft, capable of rapid positional changes and aggressive agility. When domesticated, the Tapahara is typically outfitted with a unique triple rider saddle enabling two passengers to wield handheld weaponry while the pilot takes the reins. When the Tapahara is latched onto a surface, both the passengers and pilot are able to make full use of their weapons together. Evidently, what this skittering creature lacks in distance, stamina, constitution, and weight-carrying capacity, it makes up for in maneuverability and combat versatility, ranging from 8 to 12 feet tall. Forest Rassidae Rapidosalta is a highly aggressive avian that is just barely capable of very brief flight. Instead, it uses its wings primarily for balance during its high-speed sprints. Forest Rassidae flight is actually closer to an impressive sustained leap or glide that is assisted and lengthened by flapping its wings. Forest Rassidae shows interesting traits related to theropods, such as Utahraptor, Carnotaurus, and Tyrannosaurus. It has many similar traits, such as general shape and predator patterns, but its attacks tend towards lightning-fast dashes and beak slashes. Forest Rassidae is an effective combat mount, particularly for harassing and scouting. Riders of Forest Rassidae gain most of the benefits of a fast, mobile, ground-based theropod, while also gaining some of the freedom of movement from a flyer. Assuming the rider can coax Forest Rassidae into staying in the air over a long leap, I'm not entirely sure how Therizinosaurus multiensis stays populated on the island. It is surprisingly slow for its size and is a solitary predator, so no pack to back it up.
I suppose the fact that its sheer power rivals Tyrannosaurus is the only thing that allows this very aggressive, medium-sized predator to thrive. The claws of Therizinosaurus are some of the most versatile biological tools I've encountered. As adept at removing trees and foliage from Therizinosaurus' path, as they are at piercing the thick shells and hide of the island's most defensive creatures if backed into a fight. A tamed Therizinosaurus is one of the most versatile mounts a survivor can have. It can be trained to use its claws brutally or delicately, allowing the rider to primarily harvest with enhanced efficiency the specific kinds of resources that he or she needs. And in combat, these same claws can pierce straight through the toughest armour. This flexibility more than makes up for its inability to carry the large loads of the island's many herbivorous beasts of burden. Though survivors have come to call these gargantuan reptiles spiny lizards, I believe that Moloch Sagittarius' closest relative is the Australian thorny devil, Moloch Horridus. Besides the obvious gap in size, most of the differences between Moloch Sagittarius and its smaller relative lie in its thorns. Instead of being permanent parts of its skin, Moloch Sagittarius thorns are more like spines or quills that can be removed and regrown. In fact, it is even capable of shooting these spines from its tail as a method of self-defense, and examination of these projectiles has revealed that they are coated in a lethal poison. Despite its dangerous spines, Moloch Sagittarius has proven to be an excellent mount for indirect combat. Its ranged attacks can wreak havoc in a pitched battle, particularly if other creatures are taking the enemy's attention. Additionally, Moloch Sagittarius is able to gather wood rather effectively, making it more than just an option for combat. Once saddled, it can be used as a workbench, allowing for a mobile crafting station. Thylacolio fertimorsis is a large, powerful marsupial that can often be found hunting around the trees among the island's redwoods. Its long claws and semi-opposable digits make it an apt climber, a quality that Thylacolio uses to its advantage while hunting. It clambers up large trees and waits to ambush passing prey by pouncing upon them. When something that large jumps onto a target, the victim becomes stunned and doesn't stand much of a chance. Thylacolio's most notable fighting quality is its powerful jaws. Once it bites its prey, it locks its jaw in an iron grip that can hold most smaller creatures in place. Thylacolio then goes on to savage its prey with its sharp claws. If it needs to escape from a fight, Thylacolio uses its muscular hind legs to jump back to safety among the trees. Thylacolio is a moderately strong mount, and its ability to climb trees and jump long distances makes it useful for traversal. As such, developing tribes often tame it. Small raiding parties particularly favour Thylacolio, as it is well suited to ambushes and unfair fights. Typically found within the island's caves, Titanoboa exornita is an aggressive creature that prefers dark, rocky areas. This extremely large snake, while being a member of the Titanoboa family, does not constrict its prey as most boas do. I believe this adaptation comes from coexisting with giant insects. However, the Titanoboa's venomous bite is so potent that it is known to paralyze far larger creatures. Titanoboa has developed a strange coexistence with other creatures of the island's caves. Being immune to knockout poisons and being unable to pierce the thick chitin of the insects, the species have learned to coexist. They often hunt large prey together. As they appear immune to knockout poisons, Titanoboa exornita is basically impossible to render unconscious. Because this crucial step can't be done, I'm convinced that Titanoboa are not tameable. Titanomyrma is one of the smaller creatures on the island. A frightening thought when you realise it is the size of a dog. A hive-minded carnivore, Titanomyrma is aggressive on sight to humans and their creature companions. When attacked or threatened, it releases a chemical which alerts all other Titanomyrma in a large range to help fight the aggressor. While small, Titanomyrma remain a threat because of their bite. 
Titanomyma mandibles produce a toxic venom that causes loss of stamina, preventing escape and increasing the chance of losing consciousness. I've seen two varieties of Titanomyma, drones and soldiers. Drones are smaller, faster and land-bound, with the intent to harvest for the colony. Soldiers are larger, slower, have wings, and they defend the colony. If Titanomyma is akin to hive insects, there must be queens too. But I have yet to encounter such a variant. Because of its hive mentality, I've not seen any successfully tamed Titanomyma on the island yet. Fortunately for lone survivors, Separated Titanomyma can be easily picked off for a small supply of chitin, among other natural resources. Today I witnessed an unforgettable sight. The extremely rare Titanosaurus vagacastrum. Essentially a walking mountain, it is an absolutely enormous sauropod, which has developed armoured plates of bone protrusions all over its body. Between these plates and its unparalleled size, Titanosaurus is extremely difficult to put down. In addition, Titanosaurus seems outright immune to any sort of narcotic effects. They often inadvertently crush nearby creatures underfoot with every step they take. While most sauropods ignore non-hostile creatures, Titanosaurs take issue with creatures invading its personal space. This is probably because they aggressively feed off any and all plants they can find. Titanosaurus eats constantly, which certainly helps recover health quickly, even after fighting off numerous carnivores, such as Gigantosaurus. If ever a creature were too big, it would be Titanosaurus. You'll hardly see a Titanosaurus with just a saddle and a rider. Its immense size can effectively carry a fortress, defensive emplacements, along with a small zoo. Although the Titanosaur can be domesticated, it's believed the process causes the creature to slowly starve to death from its subsequent refusal to eat. Apparently a crossbreed of Triceratops and Styracosaurus, Triceratops Sturax has both the characteristic three-horned face of Triceratops and the prominent horned ridge of Styracosaurus. Normally a very docile grazing animal, Triceratops becomes aggressive once angered. Triceratops will chase down would-be predators and egg stealers with incredible prejudice. Running away from Triceratops is harder than it seems due to its ability to charge and ram its target. I've seen Triceratops have an especially hostile reaction to the Tyrannosaurus, with herds attacking en masse. While not very fast, they are deadly in a group. A common mount for those that ride dinosaurs, Triceratops doubles as pack animal and combat dinosaur. Triceratops' bony ridge works excellently as cover from frontal attack, and the dinosaur's charge is incredibly dangerous. It is largely protective of its kind if it senses danger. In the presence of larger carnivores that appear as a threat, Triceratops becomes stronger and rallies the effort of its nearby species. It is also capable of harvesting a sizable amount of resources with its horns by shredding fruit from the leaves, making it a very useful work companion for smaller tribes. Like most trilobites, Trilobite conchodurus is an opportunistic carnivore that feeds on anything smaller than itself which it can get a hold of. A sluggish creature, the trilobite's best defense is its incredibly hard shell. This seems to be a common adaptation for the slower creatures of the island. Trilobite is not a very good source of food. The creature seems to be made mostly out of internal organs and its protective carapace. This is good for the trilobite, as both river and ocean predators are less likely to prey on it if there are better options around. The trilobite does not seem to have enough intelligence to be tamed. This doesn't mean it has no use among resourceful survivors, however. Found along beaches and in the ocean's shallows, trilobites are easily one of the best sources of oil, pearl, and chitin on the island presuming one doesn't wish to venture into the dangerous caves, quite possibly the most intelligent non-human creature on the island, Truden Magnanimous is an incredibly fast learner. It understands meaningful experiences much faster than other creatures, including humans, and its social nature means it also teaches its packmates, making them smarter too. If Truden's cleverness didn't make it formidable, then its tactics and biology would. 
It specifically pack hunts at night when we are most vulnerable and sees humans as its primary prey. This audacity is made especially dangerous due to its serrated fangs poison, which drains stamina from any creature, but outright paralyzes humans. Thankfully, Truden is fairly small. Were it larger, it might well have become the dominant creature of its ecosystem. I thought Truden simply could not be tamed, until I finally saw a lone survivor with one. She told me that she let Trudy hunt a few of her tribe's smaller creatures for sport, and it eventually started following her everywhere. It seems that while Truden is too intelligent for for the rote conditioning of trank and feed, it can instead gradually gain loyalty from a social approach that provides it with the opportunity to hunt. Ever since, I have wondered at the benefits which a pack of ultra-smart, bred-for-battle Truden may bring to a tribe brave enough to earn the favour of these clever carnivores. Up close, Tropiogonathus mzembrinus is easily recognised by the keeled crests on its snout. But with wingspans up to 27 feet, you're sure to spot it before then. These large wings are not only ideal for catching air currents over its ocean hunting grounds, but they also let Tropiogonathus draft off other flying creatures by flying behind them. While not the fastest flyer on the isles, when combined with its remarkable stamina, this makes Tropiogonathus well-suited for long-distance flight. Because it's on the wing so much, Tropiogonathus is best snared by those riding another flyer. I've noticed the more clever tribespeople using chain bowlers to capture them while airborne. Once tamed, Tropiogonathus has proven quite useful to the people of the Isles beyond mere transportation. Its toothed beak can grind down many common goods to their base components, which is a great way to recycle items and gear. Well, so long as you have a rag handy to wipe off the spit. That bite is punishing enough to crack armour and grind through it over time, and Tropiogonathus can blow away flora and fauna alike with a gust from its wings. Air-to-air -air combat is where this creature really shines, though. And with the right tools, some survivors have managed to fit them with a saddle-mounted flat cannon and jet engine for maximum lethality. <laughs> Trust me, you haven't lived until you've ridden a jet-powered pterosaur into a dogfight. Saddle one up and see for yourself. You can be my wingman any time. Tuso Teuthis vampirus is a very aggressive water predator, approximately nine metres long. Tuso Teuthis is a terror of the deep. Once it grabs its prey, it slowly crushes it into submission while using the talons on its tentacles to siphon and drink the victim's blood. Tuso Teuthis is a terrifying opponent for several reasons. Firstly, its grab slowly renders its victim unconscious, so death isn't the only concern. Secondly, its vampiric blood drain instantly revitalizes it, even during combat. Finally, if Tuso Teuthis is losing the fight, it sprays a cloud of ink into the surrounding water, blinding its attackers to cover a sneaky escape. One of the major benefits of taming Tuso Teuthis is harvesting its ink. Unlike normal ink, Tuso Teuthis ink is very oily and can even be refined into fuels such as gasoline. Between that and Tuso Teuthis' distinct capability to grab and carry large creatures underwater, it makes for an excellent aquatic tame, despite its slower speed. The Lunosaurus spina vultus dwells in the small desert found outside the abandoned city, which is particularly fitting because it looks like it's growing several cacti right on its face. As unfashionable as its facial fins might be, I recommend keeping a close eye on them. While said fins are folded inwards, the Lonosaurus behaves like your average theropod, attacking with claws and teeth. However, when those fins are spread wide, the Lonosaurus can rapidly fire a storm of spines at its prey. However, while in this state, its mobility is greatly hampered and it will eventually wear itself out. Therefore, it sometimes prefers to unleash its spines in a single deadly burst. By spinning around and firing a salvo of spines at the same time, the Lonosaurus can defend itself from every angle at once. Given its versatility, the Lonosaurus Spina Vultus makes an excellent single rider mount in most combat situations, 
but it's particularly effective when defending an entrenched position. It's like a living, breathing Gatling gun. Just be careful when giving it a congratulatory hug or pat on the head. Getting spined by your own war steed would be a rather embarrassing way to go. Torgos Arkham appears to be a relative of Torgos Turkiliotus and Torgos Negevensis, commonly called lappet-faced vultures, which are native to the sands of the Sahara, Sahel, and Negev deserts. Like them, it is a carrion bird that feeds on decaying corpses of other animals and is only aggressive when defending its meal. As such, survivors should take note when they see groups of Torgos Arkham circling above. It means that a wounded creature or a bloody battle may be somewhere below. Despite its impressive wingspan, Torgos Arkham is not suitable as a pack animal and is surprisingly light. Some survivors have even been known to keep a tame Torgos Arkham perched on their shoulder. Interestingly, Torgos Arkham is capable of storing raw meat in a separate stomach where it will decay at a slower rate. Tribes could, in theory, utilize this feature to preserve meat for recipes. Siladonta utilicero is a friendly herbivore, common to the tundra and grassland regions of the island. It is a large and dangerous creature though it seems fairly trusting of the fauna around it. Once attacked, Celadonta begins charging towards its foe. It builds up momentum as it charges, and depending on its ultimate impact speed, the results can be terrifying. With enough room to charge, it can even skewer the largest creatures in just one gore. Despite how powerful Celadonta are, many tribes still hunt them extensively due to their unique resources. Its horns can ground into a highly arousing powder, and its thick fur can support many insulating outfits, making the Celadonta in high demand. Even less advanced tribes use packs to hunt them down, though at significant peril. When not being hunted for its horns, Celadonta makes an impressive beast of burden. Its ability to take on far larger opponents provided sufficient charging room, as well as its sizable load capacity make it a solid addition to any trader party or gathering expedition. Like its relative from the island, the Draconis vipera that inhabit the aptly named dragon trenches are creatures straight out of European legend. Aside from size, the main difference between Draconis vipera and its larger cousin is that the former possesses only two legs, like an avian. Otherwise, it is quite similar with armoured scales, leathery wings, and the ability to spew projectiles from a pair of glands inside its mouth. The nature of these projectiles is tied directly to the colour of Draconis scales. Some spit fire, while others unleash poisonous acid or even bursts of bioelectricity. I can imagine no flying mount more deadly than Draconis vipera. Its strength, toughness, and ability to rain death upon one's enemies makes it unmatched in combat. The few creatures that it cannot immediately overpower, it can outmaneuver. The ridges on its back form a natural saddle, to the point where many riders preferred to ride Draconis bareback. Hmm, curious indeed. However, Draconis vipera is too resilient to domesticate once it has become an adult. It must be raised from an egg if you wish to garner its loyalty. Good luck finding and stealing one of those, though. Mother wyverns are extremely hostile and will pursue egg thieves with a vengeance. If you somehow manage to acquire a wyvern egg, you'll then need to take down a female wyvern and extract her milk to keep the baby alive. The Eutyrannus sevis is believed to be related to the Tyrannosaurus rex, but it is noticeably different upon first glance. Feathered creatures are not necessarily viewed as dangerous predators in the same light as other theropods. However, the Eutyrannus strikes fear into even the island's most skilled hunters. There are few wild predators that are able to pack hunt alongside the generally hostile Carnotaurus, like the Eutyrannus does, with such ease. It is also the only creature I've seen to consistently induce a state of panic in opponents with its roar. Upon hearing it, most creatures in the area will flee for safety. A domesticated Eutyrannus can be a powerful offensive or defensive addition to war parties. With its mighty roar, it can induce fear in opposing creatures. Meanwhile, 
Uteranus can be trained to develop a confidence-boosting battle cry, which counteracts enemy attempts to induce fear, while also bolstering the resolve of allies, and may even draw wild Carnotaurus to its aid. These unique leadership qualities make the Uteranus a versatile, and at times, a necessary creature to have on your side during large-scale confrontations.